So we are uh, very excited to have this uh, event this morning. I am Ana Navas Asien. I am the director of the Columbia University Superfund Research Program. And it's really uh, a, quite a pleasure to have our colleagues from the University of New Mexico, uh, from the University of Berkeley, from MIT, our colleagues from Colombia also, our students, our faculty, staff, everybody, and also to welcome quite a number of people remotely from different institutions and different countries even. I saw some people from Chile joining us today, so that's uh, uh, really exciting. Thank you everybody for joining us. So the idea of this symposium is to uh, kind of advance the field of biomonitoring with maybe some new methods that we are kind of borrowing from the earth sciences, the physical sciences, the ba mass balance approach. And this is, this is uh, something, it's a new application into human biomonitoring, at least as far as I know. Maybe there are some examples, maybe some of you can, can talk about this. And we've applied this method our colleagues here have applied this method to our data from the HILS cohort in the Columbia uh, Superfund Research Program. So it was, a, it, it was a good opportunity to try to extend the method to other populations. And this is the reason why we are here today, uh, working together. And we are going to be working together to try to apply the method to data from Chile and data from the Navajo Nation and here in the in the United States. So we have a quite a full agenda uh, ahead of us. And what we are going to, to be doing, first of all, is to introduce uh, the general purpose and the context of how was this method implemented and adapted. And Lex Van Geen is going to start uh, uh, doing this. Then we are going to go into more details about what the mass balance approach uh, is. And Brit uh, Human is going to explain that to us. Then we are going into understanding the different sets of data that we have. And Lex, of course, would have introduced a peer focus a little bit, but we are going to go to the University of Mexico data with Jan Lin and Daniel, Daniel Bean. Then we'll go to the Berkeley data from Chile, uh, Andres Cardenas. And then we have a, also a postdoc from MIT, Yusuf Jamil, who is going to present some simulation data. We are also going to have that which is on the agenda, and Annie Nigra, student from Colombia. She's going to show us some data from the US on water arsenic levels, community water systems all around the US. And this data yesterday we realized was potentially really relevant for New Mexico because she has all the Navajo uh, tribes data that has been provided to the EPA is in that database. So we thought it would be actually very useful for the group to also be familiar with those data. So Annie will be also presenting a little bit. And while we wait for Lex Van Geen to, and, and to, to in, uh, start with the overall uh, workshop, and the general purpose, while we wait for him, maybe we can go around the room and everybody can introduce themselves uh, a little bit. And, uh, and, and hopefully by then, uh, Lex will be here. So Nancy, do you want to start? Um, Angela Akno, uh, social research scientist and uh, scientific coordinator for the uh, Columbia Super Fund program. Right. Uh, I'm Joe Graziano, I'm the professor here at Pan Environmental Sciences. I'm Annie Nigra, I'm a doctoral student here in environmental sciences. I'm Kevin Anderson, I'm a PhD student here in environmental sciences. I'm a senior doctoral student here in environmental I'm Andres Cardenas, I'm an assistant professor. I'm Daniel Bean, I'm a data manager for the university. I'm uh, Charles or Charlie Harvey, I'm a professor at MIT Environmental Science. 
<laughs> Wonderful. We are very happy to see you. So welcome, uh, Lex. And what is I think what is remarkable is the wide range of disciplines that we have present here today. So we have from the analytical side, the people who are doing the biomonitoring in the lab, the people who understand how these metals are to start with in the environment. Why are they in the water? Why are they maybe in the soil, uh, and, and, and now we have epidemiologists, we have toxicologists. So what, now we want to start putting all these pieces together and, and try to learn from each other, from the different disciplines. That's, I think it's, it's quite a privilege. And I know we have lots, we have 15, 16 people uh, online who have joined us. 22, so we have 22 people online. So I really want to welcome all of you for joining. I think it's really exciting that you are interested in how we can apply the vast balance approach to biomonitoring. This I think shows that this is a really good topic. And I wish we could have people introduce themselves, but I think it's going to be too challenging to do it. So please, if you want to say something, I really want to encourage all of you listening online to send us a chat. Through the Zoom, you can send a chat. And Nancy is coordinating, so welcome, feel feel free to introduce yourself through the chat because that would be very helpful for us to know who you are and why you, are you interested in this topic so that hopefully we can address your concerns and your needs. Uh, so if you also have questions along the way, send your questions, we'll read them up loud and we'll be able, able to answer to you. So thank you so much, all of you online for joining. And uh, Lex, if you are ready, uh, let's move, let's start. All right, good. Good morning, everyone. Sorry again, rushing in like that. So I, I, uh, I think this is. Do I need to speak by the microphone, or it doesn't matter? Uh, uh, okay. All right. So this is a uh, uh, sort of bittersweet in, in a moment. Uh, the, uh, you know, on one end, we we know that the Bangladesh part of the Superfund research is not going to continue, uh, but at the same time, it's. I think this is a, a fitting session because it's a nice illustration of how indeed Earth geoscientists and and public health scientists have made some progress together over the past 20 years. Uh, simplifying, you know, in public health, to the extent I, I know what you're doing, you, look, you have a biomarker and you look at what the, and you try to understand the relationship between various levels of that biomarker. It could be lead in blood, it could be arsenic in urine, which is what we'll discuss today, and the health effects over time. We on the Earth, on the geoscience side, we know, you know, how to measure lead in soil relative to sun throat some threshold or arsenic relative to some guideline, we, we usually don't have access to biomarker data to try to relate the two. And I think today is a nice example of trying to do just that, that Rip is going to present to us. This is a map when we started in uh, <clears throat> the late 90s, we started to explore where to con conduct the, the HEALS cohort study, so that, which stands for Health Effects of Arsenic Longitudinal Study. Um, I don't know if Habib is with us uh, on, on, online uh, or not, but um, uh, we didn't have access to this map. It's an extraordinary map because it's, it shows the proportions of wells relative to the uh, 50 ppb standard at the time still in the US and, and still today in Bangladesh. What we did know is, is that we wanted some area where some people wouldn't be exposed and others wouldn't be exposed without too many other things being different between these ports of, of the population. And so, after a couple of trips, uh, um, this is the area that was, uh, that was selected in Aray Hazar. Um, here are some photos that go back 20 years, in fact. Uh, Ratan Dar, in particular, who used to work in, uh, who got his master's in Dipankar Chakaborty's lab in Calcutta. Uh, we were very lucky that he had uh, won the, the green card uh, through the lottery and had come to the US. And uh, Yan Zeng, one of our colleagues, uh, met him, brought him in, and that was, I think, a very important launching moment. And so we started tagging these wells. This is what a typical tube well looks like in, in Bangladesh, and some of the uh, interviews were launched at the time. A again, um, this person, particularly Jana, I saw her a lot of uh, three weeks ago again in, in Ara Hazar, so she's still involved in the study. So the, the job for us uh, uh, 
was sort of unusual for a scientist. I think on our own, we never would have said, let's go and sample and test 6,000 wells over a certain area. Uh, but so we were, we did this as a service. We thought, let's be nice to uh, Joe and everyone else. And, <laughs> and as uh, I think Janet Herring, who now uh, is the director of AIWAG, said, she was a member of our, of our uh, advisory board in the early years, she said, this is probably the most useful thing we ever did on the geoscience <laughs> side. And I think she has a point. We essentially, all the, our work was directed around that afterwards. Um, so this is what the, um, the cohort of 12,000 people, and Britt will tell you more about them, these, uh, uh, these are the, uh, is the distribution of arsenic in the wells, about 4,000 wells that they were driven, drinking from in uh, 2000 and 2001. So the, the sampling was split into two periods. And you see here, um, and the, the color coding, sure, yes, you're right. The, like this one, yes. So the color coding in the pie diagram shows you that the light blue indicates wells that, mean the, that meet the WHO guideline of 10 micrograms per liter. Green is between that and 50 ppb, uh, still the standard in Bangladesh, as I said. And then the rest above that up to about 900 ppb. So a very wide range of concentration is covered by that red portion of the pie. And what you can see is that more than half the people in the cohort were exposed to, to these very high levels of arsenic. Um, what is striking, and we didn't necessarily expect, of course, is this spatial variability, with some villagers having a mixed distribution of, uh, of arsenic in, in, in their wells, others being essentially largely safe to the northwest, and some villagers without any really safe water drinking options. Um, <clears throat> So uh, this was the situation, and in fact, what we're going to talk about today is really refers back to that in initial recruitment. I will in a second show you what this exposure looks like today. But before I do that, um, I want to give you a sort of zooming in on one of these villages. You know, what does the distribution of arsenic look like? And so, uh, uh, so you have uh, uh, some trees, tree cover, so the, the, the houses are limited typically to the to the uh, non-cultivated area, that's where people live. And around it, you have, um, <clears throat> typically you have rice fields, mostly rice fields around it. So that's how the wells are, are clustered. So these clusters that you saw earlier were essentially the inhabitant areas around Al Hazard. And our particular study area square, covers 25 square kilometers. And so it reflects the geology, slightly raised areas where flooding is less likely. Um, what's striking, of course, is that if, um, uh, and, and I think and that will be relevant to what Brint will tell you, is that if you live, for instance, at one of these locations, you have a lot of other wells around you, your neighbors drink from other wells, and often the arsenic concentration will be different in those wells than your own primary wells, your own primary well. Most of these wells are privately installed, paid for, they cost between $100 and $150, a significant investment, but clearly people express their appreciation for having their own well at home. Um, so just sort of referring to a, 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 a couple of previous studies. So one um, analysis of the uh, water arsenic data and the urine data was conducted by a group here uh, at, uh, at the US EPA, El Masri et al. And, um, and, and, and looking at those results is, was one of the ways that we, we, that, that we thought of maybe looking at it in a somewhat different way. Uh, the, uh, the data will essentially be the same as what's plotted in the original El Masri paper here with well water arsenic, primary well water arsenic concentrations on, on the bottom scale and the, uh, in this case, actually creatinine adjusted. We are going to do without the creatinine adjustment in Brits discussion. And um, as I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially the point of El Masri et al. was that um, the, this, uh, this relationship could be explained best if you included a certain food arsenic component. But the authors themselves admit that, you know, that helps sort of lift what happens in terms of urine arsenic at the low end of the water arsenic, but it doesn't do much to explain what's happening at the higher end. And I think what you'll see is that Brit's approach to this is that essentially it resolves some of these uh, issues. Um, not necessarily in the way that we anticipated at the beginning. 
Um, the, that Al-Masri paper, by the way, goes back to an incredibly, to me, difficult uh, paper to understand with these uh, uh, 56 different compartments in the body with their own kinetics, uh, partitioning co uh, co coefficients. Um, I'm sure they did what they could and try to constrain that. Uh, this is going to be a very different approach. It's, it, I mean, they discussed mass balance, as we will today, but it's within the body. And instead, what Britt is going to show is the mass balance for the body overall. So it's a bit of a black box. And rather than focusing on what happens within the compartments is what really leads into the compartments and what goes out considering the body as a whole. Um, this will be my, my last slide uh, or next to last. So this is, you know, where does this come from? This was really Charlie Harvey's idea. Uh, um, although uh, uh, quite a while back right now. Um, when we think of lakes, for instance, imagine that this box is a lake and you have a, a river that leads into it. You have a stream that goes out to it. You could, you're going to lose some water to evaporation. You're going to lose, maybe you have an input of groundwater. Uh, and so you have some water fluxes of, uh, uh, that are associated with that. And in, in the, on average, these have to balance if the water level doesn't change a lot. And so that's expressed essentially in that upper very simple equation. The water in from the river plus the water in from the groundwater has to equal on average how much is lost to evaporation and how much is, is lost to a stream down. Uh, for, down. So that's, so what, what is hard to measure? Well, I think that you know, the, the, the water in the streams is relatively easy to measure. Evaporation will be hard and certainly the groundwater will be hard. So how do you solve that? So, that's sort of an, an analogy to what Britt will be doing. Let's bring in another indicator of what's happening. Let's I think salt. I'm not even going to call it you know, chloride or, or, or sodium, whatever. Let's say salt. So there's some salt coming in with the stream. There's some coming out. There's no salt being list, uh, lost to evaporation. And you have some salt coming in through the groundwater. So now you have another unknown. Um, uh, uh, you have another equation. And at the beginning, you had you know, one equation, two unknowns. Now you have two equations. So essentially, you can solve the system by setting up a mass balance for something other than the water. And in essence, that's what Britt is going to do with, essentially focusing more on you know, what are these other sources. She's going to put some constraints on that. OK, so um, I think I was able to catch up a bit here. As I said, this was the exposure in 2000. If we have time later in the day, we can discuss what happened since. But the, the, the happy news is that today, the same people are drinking from water that's indicated by this map. So clearly, a significant expansion of the good portion of the pie, uh, a shrinking of the bad portion of the pie. What is determining that? Uh, why is not everybody drinking from safe water? Those are the types of questions that obviously we continue to study, including with economists you know, who think about the behavior, incentives, and things of that nature. Um, this is all I have to say. Thank you. Questions, or should are we move questions, on? Are there questions, or we can move to Brit? Uh, any questions in the audience here, or online? Okay, you can go. All right. And the questions might come as we move. <laughs> that was very useful, the, the school example. <laughs> I can just let you know while waiting that, that last slide, the only one on this one. I teach the environmental health science course in the fall to the large crowd. It's the only slide that. Hey everyone, um, so I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about how we've applied our mass balance models for water and for arsenic to this community in Ryazar, Bangladesh to understand the sources of arsenic exposure for this community. How do I? Okay. So to give a little bit of context for this and sort of the motivations for why we are trying to better break down the sources of arsenic exposure, um, there's been a lot of work done in the health field to link different amounts of arsenic exposure to different health responses. And when it comes to looking at water exposure, it's pretty common to assume that people's exposure is coming from their primary drinking water source. Um, and then this linkage between 
sources of exposure, um, amounts of exposure and health responses is used to inform things like the World Health Organization standard for arsenic and water or standards set in the US by the EPA. So we really wanted to focus in on the dose part of this and understand is using someone's primary well arsenic a good metric of their exposure in this community or are there other exposure routes that could perhaps um, help us improve the dose estimation and thus the linkage between dose and response. In addition to that, um, understanding people's sources of arsenic exposure is useful for mitigation because you want to know where people are getting their exposure in order to figure out how to decrease that exposure. So let's already describe the HEALS data. So we were working with that data for this study. Um, just to highlight specifically the parts of that data we were working with, we were using the um, measurements of arsenic in all the wells throughout this study area and those well locations. So that was really valuable for this. And then also for um, about 3,000 participants, um, we were looking at their primary well arsenic for each of those people and the urinary arsenic for each of those people. So now we'll take a look at the mass balance. And I'm going to start with a simplified version of the mass balance model. It has the same form as um, the sort of more complicated, more realistic equation, but I'm going to leave out um, a few fluxes just to make it easier to follow initially. So for now, I'm going to leave out the fluxes for food, for arsenic storage in the body, for loss through feces, and for water through cellular respiration. We'll come back to that, and I'll explain those when we get to the more complex version. Um, but just to start with, here we're looking at the mass balance on water for an individual. So the water that enters a person's body is um, over the long term equal to the water that leaves their body. And so that's equal to some overall flux Q. Wait, can you put the mouse of people on my side? Yeah, I'll try to remember to do that. Um, and then we can break that down into the the different pathways by which water enters and leaves the body. So in this simplified version of the model, we have water entering the body when people drink from, when each person drinks from their primary well. And then we have another flux just for people drinking through wells spread out throughout the study area. And then water is leaving the body through evaporative processes. Um, so um, perspiration and also respiration and then um, leaving the body also through urine. And so the way that we describe those in our equation is we take this overall um, flux of water through the body Q, and then we just multiply it by the fraction of water that is either entering or leaving the body from each of these sources. So for example, for water that is entering the body through people's primary well, we take the overall flow of water Q multiplied by the fraction of water people get from their primary well. And then similarly- the webinar for on other arsenic and drinking water. So that's the water balance. And then building on this, we can also look at an arsenic balance for the body. So again, entering the body is considered the wrong dust equal to arsenic leaving the body. Um, and again, this is a simplified version of the model. So I'll um, a version in a little bit with some more terms in it. But in this version of the model, we have arsenic um, entering through people's primary wells and also um, when they drink water from other wells in the study area and then leaving through urination. Um, oh, evaporative okay. uh, pathways are not Columbia really University, that. Um, UNM, and body, so that's UC not Berkeley. included oh. here. Oh. And then um, oh. in our equation, what this looks <laughs> like is we take that water flux from each of these good. pathways and we multiply it by the arsenic concentration in that water. So for example, if someone is drinking water from their primary well and getting arsenic that way, we take this um, flux of water from the primary well that we um, showed in our previous equation and we just multiply that by the arsenic concentration in that well water. And then similarly for arsenic from other wells or arsenic leaving the body through urine. So once we have this mass balance equation on arsenic, we can rearrange it and take um, expected values of the terms in this equation to get the expected value of arsenic in a person's urine as a function of the arsenic concentration in that person's primary well, and then these other terms in our equation. Since we've taken expected values, these terms are now understood to represent averages across the population for each of these parameters. So the idea is we have urinary arsenic measurements and we have primary well arsenic measurements for this population. And we expect to see based on this mass balance some underlying linear relationship between urinary arsenic and primary well arsenic um, that has a slope and an intercept equal to these um, terms here. So to give 
sort of a conceptual understanding of what the slope and the intercept are. So the intercept is obviously telling us when someone has no arsenic in their primary well, how much arsenic do we still expect to see in their urine? And in this simplified version of the model, all of the arsenic that we'd see in the urine is coming from other well water that people are drinking. In the more complicated version of the model, there will be other factors contributing to that. And then the slope of the equation is just telling us as primary well arsenic increases, um, how does urinary arsenic increase with that? And so that has some relationship to how concentrated is the arsenic in people's urine compared to what it is in the primary well water that they're drinking. So now we're going to take a look at the more complicated version of the model, and then we'll look at how that model um, is applied with our data. So adding in some additional terms, here we're looking again at the water balance on an individual. So they're getting water now from their primary wells, from other wells, but we've also added a term for water from food, and then water generated within the body through cellular respiration. And then water is lost from the body through evaporation, urination, and defecation. And then for arsenic, now we've also added this possibility of arsenic storage over the long term in the body. And so we have arsenic entering the body when people drink arsenic contaminated water from their primary well, from other wells in the study area, but also when people eat food containing arsenic. We have arsenic lost from the body through urination and through defecation. And then we have the potential for a long term sink of arsenic in the body. So this is our more realistic version of the arsenic balance. But we can similarly rearrange this and take expected values to get this um, slope-intercept equation again that describes the expected value of urinary arsenic as a function of arsenic in the primary well. Um, and now we can actually take our urinary arsenic and our primary well arsenic observations and fit um, a linear regression to them to find out what the actual values of this slope and intercept are. Um, so here I'm showing the observed data for urinary arsenic and primary household well arsenic. You can see that there's quite a bit of scatter. So primary household well arsenic is a factor that determines urinary arsenic, but there are other factors on an individual level that we aren't yet capturing in this model. However, the primary household well arsenic can describe um, about 27% of the variance that we're seeing in the urinary arsenic based on this R squared value. Um, and the P value is very strong, so we know this is a um, significant relationship. And we can actually visualize that a little bit better oops, um, if we bin these data. So here I'm binning the data into 15 bins just with increasing primary household well arsenic, um, roughly equally sized bins. And what you can see is that once you bin the data um, and get rid of some of that scatter visually, there is this underlying linear relationship that um, is what we anticipate seeing based on the mass balance on people's arsenic consumption and excretion. So this slope, one question, this yeah. slope and the other slope, they're the same slope on the individual level or group level, the red line is the same, just the different angle is because of the different units or are they different lines? Do you understand my question? Did you build the red, the slope for the left side the figure is it based on the individual level data versus the one on the right side figure is based on the group level data? So these are both the same regression. The slope looks a little different because uh, yeah, the axis, axis that's okay. all. Yes. I so that part. Yeah. So we have now numerical values for the slope and the intercept, and we know what those are symbolically from our mass balance. And so we can use this to start to solve for some parameters of interest. So what we are really interested in here is the fraction of water people get from their primary well versus how much water they're drinking from other wells in this study area, because that's going to tell us something about their sources of arsenic exposure. Um, additionally, we have two equations, so we can solve for two unknowns. The other thing we're going to solve for is F sub U, which is the fraction of water people are using through uh, losing through urine. Um, that one is a little hard it would have very wide error bars and is a little hard to estimate based on just what we could find in the literature and we don't have direct observations for our population. So we're going to solve for that and then we can see if it gives a plausible um, number and that'll give us some checks on our model. Um, so to just, so, so one yeah. question before because I'm trying to think of yeah. our colleagues in the data like that programming. So the slope and the intercept, that's what comes from your regression model. Yes. So that's, do we need to build your, already kind of 
played a little bit yesterday. So you would need to use those data is what is going to be inputted input into the and assignment. if they have other individually tailored measurements of like arsenic input, then they may have like multiple slopes basically, because it may be a you may fit the regression to multiple parameters. So mm -hmm. So if we solve just symbolically for F sub P and F sub U, um, we can see what we get here. So we know the slope and the intercept now, um, but we're gonna need to estimate these other parameters based on either direct observations at our study site or um, observations from the scientific literature in order to get numerical solutions. So this is a large table, but I just wanna step you through what each of these other parameters are that we're estimating so you have a sense. So we estimate the fraction of water consumed via food to be about 20%, the fraction of water produced from cellular respiration to be 12%, the mass fraction of arsenic lost via feces to be about 6%, um, the mass fraction of arsenic lost to a deep compartment in the body is um, negligible, the mass of arsenic consumed via food is estimated for this population at 64 micrograms per day, the volume of water consumed, three liters per day, and the average arsenic of all wells in the study area, 95.2 micrograms per liter. So we can take all of these values and plug them into our equation to get the numerical solutions for F sub P and F sub U. And when we do that, the fraction of water that people consume from primary wells, F sub P, is estimated to be about 50%. That's assuming that 32% of people's water is coming from food and cellular respiration. And so what that leaves us with, with water consumption from other wells, is 18% um, of people's overall water input to the body is coming from other wells. We also solved for F sub U, as I mentioned. We're estimating that about 60% of people's water is lost to urine, um, and that is within the range of plausible values from the literature, so that's a good check that our model is giving us some reasonable results. So this is sort of the first big take-home message from the model is, we solved for these parameters and we're now getting this breakdown of how much water people are getting from their primary well versus from other wells throughout the study area. But we can also use this model to test other hypotheses that we have about people's drinking water consumption. So there were two hypotheses that we decided to test here. Um, the first is the hypothesis that when people are not drinking from their primary well, they are preferentially drinking water from wells near their primary well. And the way we decided to test this was um, to use various radii um, and assume uh, a source of drinking water from some wells near their primary well, and then to try like all wells within a 20 meter radius or all wells within a 50 meter radius um, to see if any of those um, would help us better explain what we see in terms of people's urinary arsenic. And then the other hypothesis we wanted to test was actually based on self-reports from people in this study area. Um, what we found was that um, men were reporting consuming a lot more water from other wells um, with a lot of variability across different men, whereas women were mostly saying that they were getting all, um, a large amount of their water from their primary wells. So we wanted to see if using our mass balance model, we would actually observe these gender differences in um, sources of water consumption. So to take a look at this first hypothesis, that people are getting um, uh, water, especially from wells near their primary well, we've just added a term to this equation for those nearby wells. So here we have the fraction of water coming from those wells multiplied by Q, the total flow rate of water um, into the body, multiplied by the arsenic concentration in those nearby wells. And as I mentioned, we can use our concentration in all wells within 20 meters or 50 meters, and we actually tested a range from 20 meters all the way up to 500 meters to see how um, all of those would fare. So here I'm just showing the results from the, the 20 meter radius, but they were pretty comparable across the different radii. What we found when we fitted this um, original distributed well model where we didn't include that neighboring well term and then when we fitted that model that had the additional neighboring well term is that we um, the neighboring wells did not explain additional variation so basically the r squared was the same and they didn't offer us the ability to explain any more of people's urinary arsenic variation 
We also found that when we actually directly solved for the fraction of water that people get from neighboring wells, that it was quite low, only about 5%. So we actually invalidated that hypothesis. We found people are drinking from their primary well and from wells throughout the study area. They're not really preferentially drinking from wells near their primary well. Um, and perhaps this isn't so surprising. When people are at home, then they're drinking from their home well. And when they're drinking from other wells, they're out somewhere else in the study area at work or at a tea stall or something like that. Um, so that is our first hypothesis. And then circling back to our second hypothesis about the difference between men and women, um, we just fit our, um, our mass balance model separately to the men and to the women in our um, study population. And we found that the R squared for women was higher than for men. So women's primary well arsenic explained more of the variance in their urinary arsenic um, compared to men. And then when we solved for F sub P, the fraction of water consumed from the primary well, we got 55% for women and 45% for men. Again, assuming um, that 32% of the water was coming from cellular respiration and from food. So overall, we are seeing um, incongruence with the self-reports that women are getting more of their water from primary wells compared to men. Now, we'd like to compare this actually directly with the self-reports to see how well the numbers line up. Um, to do that, we're going to have to um, adjust this slightly. So the self-reports are only for drinking water consumed. Um, this 55% right now includes drinking water and also food and also cellular respiration. So the drinking water consumption here from other wells and from the primary well makes up 68% of people's total water input. So we'll divide these numbers by 0.68 to get the percent of drinking water consumption that they make up, and then we can compare those to the self-reports. So I've done that here. So these are those same numbers divided by 0.68, and then these are the self-report values. So women self-reported getting 91% of their water on average from their primary wells, and the mass balance estimated 81 plus or minus 15%. Men self-reported getting 70% of water on average from their primary wells, and the mass balance estimated 66 plus or minus 13%. So these do fit with the self-reports within the range of error on the values. And we do see the same trend again of women drinking more from the primary wells than men do. So we've talked a lot about sources of drinking water, but of course what we care about ultimately is arsenic exposure. And so now let's bring that back around to what does this mean in terms of people's arsenic exposure. So here we're looking at contribution to arsenic consumption from different sources in micrograms per day. Specifically, we're looking at food, we're looking at people's primary wells, and then we're looking at people drinking from other wells distributed throughout the study area. And we're looking at this as a function of people's primary well arsenic. So the top axis is primary well arsenic in micrograms per liter. And then the bottom axis is primary household well arsenic percentile. So this is scaling um, basically by how many people have wells with the different arsenic concentrations. And what I find interesting here is that um, a lot of people, let's say in the bottom 40% or so in terms of their primary well arsenic, their exposures are actually dominated by water they're getting from other wells in the study area, followed by um, arsenic that they're getting from food. Um, and the primary well is actually, um, especially for people with very low well arsenic, is a, is a very small fraction. Um, and really doesn't come to dominate people's arsenic exposure until about the 40th percentile. So this tells us that especially for people with low primary well arsenic, it's important to be aware that their arsenic consumption may be dominated by other sources. So the final thing that I want to look at is um, bringing this back around to the dose response models and what implications this might have for linking arsenic dose to health responses. So here's a study from some of our collaborators using the data from uh, the HEALS cohort. And um, they tried linking dose to response in various ways. Um, but one of the ways that they looked at was the arsenic concentration in primary well water and then um, all-cause mortality hazard ratio. So how um, the risk of mortality compared to this baseline group with the lowest arsenic exposure. Um, and they broke the exposure into four quartiles, um, 
from 0.1 to 10 micrograms per liter arsenic in well water and then 10 to 50, 50 to 150 or above 150. I've added for context the average arsenic concentration for each of these quartiles. Um, and so we have some relationship here between people's primary well arsenic and mortality. But based on what we've done here with the mass balance model, we can go a step further and say, what's the average arsenic concentration people are getting in all the water they're drinking, primary wells and the other wells throughout the study area, and how does that relate to mortality? So here I've added this new column to the table for the average arsenic in all water consumed. And looking at this um, group with the lowest primary well arsenic, the average arsenic in their primary well water is about five micrograms per liter. But if you look at the arsenic in all the water they're consuming, including the other wells throughout the study area that people are drinking from, the average arsenic is really about 29 micrograms per liter. So if you focus too much on the primary well arsenic, you may be underestimating exposures for this group if you don't also think about the average arsenic in all the water they're consuming. I haven't added food arsenic in here, but the same type of effect would be seen even further if we also add food arsenic in, and we assume people are getting um, roughly similar amounts of food arsenic throughout the study area. <coughs> um, oops, that's not quite aligned. Um, if we look at the highest quartile, um, the people who have the, the highest arsenic in their well water, um, we see that on average, the primary household well water is 268 micrograms per liter um, arsenic, and the average arsenic in all the water they're consuming is 222 micrograms per liter. So actually here, because they're drinking from other wells that are on average lower than their primary well, focusing too much on the primary well may overestimate the arsenic consumption for this group. Um, so overall, this range of hazard ratios that we're seeing, um, if we think about all the water people are consuming, it's actually over maybe a smaller range of arsenic concentrations in water. So just to summarize, um, we found that we can use this mass balance model to estimate sources of arsenic exposure. Um, and that then we can use this model with some tweaks to test various hypotheses. Here we tested two different hypotheses and we found that participants did not preferentially drink from neighboring wells when they were um, drinking from wells other than their primary well. Um, and then we confirmed the hypothesis that men are drinking more from other wells than women are in congruence with the self-reports from the study area. Um, we also highlighted the fact that, especially for participants with low arsenic primary wells, they're actually getting most of their arsenic exposure from other wells in the study area. Um, and then we explored um, the inclusion of other sources of arsenic exposure aside from the primary well, and the potential that that has to enable um, a better linkage between arsenic dose and health response. So that's all I have. If people have questions, I'm happy to take them. That was magnificent. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> magnificent. Thank you. And I'm really sorry that Alan Smith is not in the room. I, I don't know if he's online, but Alan was a member of our external advisory he's, board. He's part of the Berkeley. Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah. I, but Alan himself was part of our external advisory board. And when we were presenting these early results uh, to the Argos paper and others, Alan was pound the table and said, it can't be, it can't be that, that these water concentrations you, know, you have adverse effects and from death to cardiovascular disease. Good, good. There's got to be something else going on, and, and we just told the story that I um, would like to hear. <laughs> yeah, I have a question um, for you and many of us on your honor. Others. So, in this cohort, you don't have to worry about seafood intake, right? So, you can kind of use total arsenic in water and urine. My question is to expand this to a cohort like in Chile, where they might have a lot of seafood intake. Is it as simple as replacing the total arsenic with the inorganic arsenic biomarker that we would typically use, the sum of the inorganic in DMA and MMA? Or, Anna, do you think it's more complicated and the model would have to be somehow changed for that? I mean, as, as it's going to be more complicated because 
part of the GMA. Generally, we, in the urine, we have inorganic arsenic, MMA, and DNA. And this adds up to the total arsenic. And those three types of species, they are reflecting the original inorganic arsenic exposure. But if you have seafood, part of the DNA is not coming from the inorganic arsenic, but it's coming from some of the other species that also have DNA. So the mass balance model is going to fail in that and unless you combine it all as total arsenic. Uh, but you need to, uh, those pieces are so complicated. I, 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 I mean, I'm yeah. curious to see what, it, or it, it's, if you have a, a, an organic source of arsenic, that will be part of your food. Your inputs. And yeah. you just, you, you need to estimate you're, the you're, going, you're pushing it a step beyond. Mm -hmm. You're saying, we want to track individual species and do the mass balance. That's, that's a big okay. step. I think here, this is just okay. all of them combined, okay. what goes in and goes out. And so I think you may want to do that step first. Yeah. So you would need to estimate how much you is coming from seafood. As a total art. Do they have different effects on the body? Totally different. So well, it's totally to not toxic. Do them separately yes. and have some expression for the uh, transformation within the something, body. Something that we've yeah. done, something that mm -hmm. we've developed, is to an estimation of the arsenic in the urine that is not derived from seafood. Yeah. And we do that by regressing your uh, arsenic. The, the good thing is that the seafood arsenicals, one of them, arsenobutane, we can measure it very well in the lab. So we can use that as a surrogate of your total organic arsenicals, including the ones that we cannot measure in the lab, but that contribute to total arsenic. So what we do is we regress total arsenic on arsenobutane, we take the residuals, so those residuals are now totally independent on seafood arsenic, more or less. And then we add that, those residuals, we add them to the average arsenic among those with very low arsenobutane, with no arsenobutane. So that we reconstruct the arsenic in the urine that is not derived from seafood. I think that potentially can be useful in populations that have uh, arsenic from seafood so that you say now I have my total arsenic that combines the seafood arsenic mm -hmm. and the water, rice, or the other inorganic arsenic. And now I have my ars total arsenic not derived from seafood. So you remove the seafood from the from the story. Can I suggest I, I've seen yeah. you present this before mm -hmm. and you have one or two slides that I think can be presented or or you can uh -huh. I think it would be helpful to see that visually. Uh-huh. For People yeah. The so very good. We can add that to the, to the. I think it's, it's for most populations in the world that are in many are eating seafood. It's, it's a oh. I have a question from somebody online. It says, um, "Thank you. That was great. Are there plans to do a sensitivity analysis on the mass balance inputs to determine which needs to be refined?" Mm. So we have been doing some sensitivity analyses on the inputs, particularly the ones that we feel especially uncertain of, like um, arsenic coming in via food. And so we are planning to include some of that in our publication. And, and you also, you propagated errors, right? Yes, yeah. So here we've, so we've propagated like errors on things, yeah. Is that a second question? No. We were also wondering, does this consider any other exposure laws like there? So our model... Can you repeat that? Story? Yeah, sorry. That was, so that the people online... Yeah. So the question was, um, does this consider additional exposure routes such as air? And so in our model, we've assumed for this population that that's not a significant exposure route, but obviously in other populations, it certainly could be. And that could be incorporated. You would need to have some way of going from measurements of arsenic and air, whatever those are, to a flux into the body um, so that you could put it in the same terms as the other things in the model. If you, um, if you didn't have the <coughs> other well problem, mm -hmm. you could sort of replace that problem with the problem of how much comes mm -hmm. in yep. and, and do mm -hmm. essentially the same thing, except you're not, it's not also a source of water, which mm -hmm. uh, I think might make it easier. What you did, so I don't, but I don't know. 
that's yeah. the most something that yeah. when, when you start working with the data later on the the units in the dust I am not sure how you compare that. You know, in the water, it's obviously microns per liter. In the urine, it's microns per liter. It's kind of, and we know that what comes through the water goes through the urine, as we shown before. But here, I am still not sure how well, you translate. So, in, in that. the mass balance for arsenic, it's always that concentration times the volume mm -hmm. flux of water. Mm -hmm. So, it's actually mass per time. Yeah. Okay. So, you would just do it. Like do we need to translate yep. it into the same units? To do oh, mass per time. Mass mass time. time. Mass. It, 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 it is mass per time. Mass per time. Yep. But, but if you have concentration of arsenic in your dust, in you will dust. need some yeah. dust in inhalation rate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 You know how many how much liters per yeah. day you breathe yeah. though, and yeah. have a transfer factor that says X right. percent. So that's going to be needed to uh, to the mm -hmm. data. So well, I don't know what what you would yeah. get out of. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you get out of it is mass of arsenic per time intake. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you care about the mass of the other elements in the dust. Mm -hmm. They might be good. They might be good checks, though, of intestinal exposure. Having other elements would theoretically also have mass mass fluxes that are proportional, like lead. Do you have uranium, no? We have uranium. Okay. <laughs> so now you're going another step. You're going to measure another element. What's your physical way to go? But I'm just finding the data. Good back to Joe's point, I remember the conversation with Alan Smith, but I don't think that was cardiovascular disease. I think he felt more strongly about the lesions at what seemed to be lower yeah, exposure absolutely. levels. Yeah. And that's why I think he yeah. also he felt yeah, because more strongly about the radicals are not really right. dark. And, and yeah. now we can explain that. Yeah. Right, I had a question. If you go back to your cumulative flood, um, I think you know we're comparing data against. Sorry, where? Yeah, the cumulative flood of fluid ah. and water. Yeah. 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 That was, that's and super useful. Yeah, that's yeah. because you know we're really at least in our data we're in the lower end, you know, maybe mm -hmm. between fifty and zero. And I think they, you know, the data from you and Abby are also in the lower end as well. So, mm -hmm. do you think it's going to be really important for us to try to characterize like food and like potentially other sources? I mean, we already have <laughs> other wells, but we have you know potentially drinking water from water sources. Yeah, I mean. It Every population could be different, so I think it depends for your population which sources you think are based on whatever data you already have or what you already know, which sources you think are likely to dominate for that population. But do you think in this lower range that we're going to have more error just because our primary drinking water source is probably not the major contributor to urinary arsenic? I and mean, that's what we're seeing, you know, lower correlations at the lower end. Yeah, I mean, that that would be consistent with other sources being an important factor. Mm -hmm. So it might be that in the mass balance model, we really should think about the food and its diet. And yeah, if you think those are likely to be significant contributors, it would do you well to do us well to think about how to characterize those. It depends what you think is going to dominate. So is arsenic and water not an important source? In your study? Well, it is, and that's the assumption that pretty much everyone has been doing. But if we get lower correlations, we look at, you know, I think we'll both are going to present all the data, but yeah, it's not as dominant. You know, when you have the whole range of very high levels, I feel like the slope is very influenced by those with very high levels. So it's mm -hmm. getting a lot of parts mm -hmm. yeah. But you, you could look at it this way is that in the Bangladesh case, the water goes particularly high. So that simplifies the problem to some extent. Yeah. But if people don't drink only from their primary well, it brings a complication back yeah. into it. So it's a trade-off between these two things. So. I think in your case, your your neighboring wells are lower in arsenic, so the other wells sli slice of exposure is likely to be smaller. That's right. And more similar to the to the blue one that's lower underneath. Mm -hmm. um, not not a guarantee, but that would be a at least a likely possibility. And the food is more variable. This is, I think this food model is going to be a single concentration of arsenic in food and yeah. large rice exposure. We know that rice by far dominates people's diets, so we made the simplifying assumption here that people's arsenic exposure was coming from the arsenic and the rice that they consumed. But obviously for other populations, that's not going to be as representative.
and, and there's more variability in rice arsenic mm -hmm. than yeah. Yeah. Could you just speak to the fact we did have a uh, arsenic analyses from a random sample of households that we kind of went into the manuscript, but you just commented on that. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I mean, so we used food exposure estimates, a few different food exposure estimates that are in the manuscript but that I didn't go over here, including some from a random sample of households within this study area. And the different food estimates that we use led to similar general conclusions for our data. But the average was higher, I think, right? By the fact that two and a half? The average. The El Nasri uh, of uh, study has a certain figure. And I think what was actually measured in cooked rice was higher. Is that right? A factor of two or something like that? Mm, maybe not a factor of two. I see. But it, yeah, our, our other estimate of food was higher. Um, and it led to slightly different numbers coming out for estimates of arsenic in neighboring wells, but it wasn't the same general conclusions that we draw here still apply regardless of which estimate we use. I think the thing you need to be careful of here is if the food arsenic is correlated with the primary well. Mm -hmm. Because it's the, the big cook, especially, it would become a food. Yes, that, that's the. Except the cooked and uncooked rice the same had yeah. the same average. Yeah, yeah, and it is what they're actually eating. It's another you, know, you, you, you consider how much water they drink and what their yeah. concentration is and get the mass. But it is this additional input is in fact okay. Arsenic in the rice may have come from the cooked in the water, but at the end of the day, the mass being ingest, ingested is. is hmm. Yeah. So, one of the when I see all the odds ratios, they're all relative to a low exposure group. Mm -hmm. And what I see here is that the low exposure group kind of disappeared. A little bit. You don't bit. really have a low, just low exposure yeah. group. So low, low. What would you recommend <laughs> as the low exposure group if you were to reevaluate the Argo study, okay. for example, with a, a different baseline population? What baseline population would you recommend? Mm. I don't know. That's more of a health question. I think that's that's the problem of uh, uh, variability and comparability within populations. And sometimes we don't have the real widespread range of exposure levels that we would like. Most general, most populations tend to be exposed to similar levels. So I think in the in the Hills cohort is really lacking the truly very low level. Uh, People. What might actually do is underestimate the real impact of the exposure in cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease because this relative risk that we are seeing are probably underestimated yeah. if we were able to truly have an unexposed yeah. category. And it might be the reason why the dose response is also not very linear, it's not totally clear. I think there is a lot of measurement error and complications in, in the population. And that's generally the case for most environmental exposure. For instance, if you think of lead, in the 70s, in the, in the 60s, everybody was breathing lead and had very high levels. When you, the first studies on lead and cardiovascular disease, they found excess risk, but not as dramatic as the ones, the relative risk that we find today. And the reason that I can anticipate is because everybody was breathing the same amount of lead. You didn't have the variability in exposure to be able to compare the risk. Well, today we have a much higher variability in exposure. So you can actually compare highly exposed to lower exposure. So that's why within a population, and uh, the epidemiological research is very complicated if you don't have true variability, heterogeneity. Next question. Yeah. Well, you go to your last slide. I want to see if I understand. So, what else? Or no, I guess the one before this that. Side. What Alan Smith was probably surprised about was going from the first group to the second group. Right? Um, mm -hmm. So, it. But for that, first that key lesions, because this well, is 135, that's yeah. a very small effect. Yeah. 
So but here it's not a surprise. There's a comparable analysis looking yeah. at the risk of skin lesion on it. Right. But this, I'm not, I just want to, I'm not sure that this completely answers this question no. because both the first and the second group have now been lifted up. Mm -hmm. So it's still, if you if you take this as a dose, it's a change from about 30 to about 50, <laughs> as opposed to a change of about 5 to 30. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, would that still be surprising to him, or would that answer his question? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For me, what's the most surprising is that the group, the third group, is the one that doesn't change at all. Well, that's and because it's, it's the, in the average. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that is the one that doesn't make any sense from the relative hazard ratio perspective. Well, of course, it's because you are comparing also to the wrong group, and there is a lot of measurement error and lots of other additional complications. But yeah, but it, this just response is not is not clear. It's not. It's not anyway. That's the complications of the epidemiological reason. <laughs> I, I still think it's important. You could say that the iris of all paper also looks like urine arsenic, right? And, mm -hmm. and yeah. So you say, well, but at the same time, regulation is not based on urine arsenic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's based on water. So you do yeah. need to understand the water to urine yeah. uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think your, your work is good. Good. So, okay. So let's then move to, um, we are pretty close to the end. Today. Right. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for the people online, we apologize if you have something else to do. We put them on this now. But let's start uh, learning about these other uh, studies and the other data that we have, and that hopefully we can apply the mass data. So let's start with uh, New Mexico. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so Daniel and I will uh, co-present today. Um, so we're presenting some of the context information of the uh, University of New Mexico Metal Superfund Center and how we might integrate environmental and biomonitoring data together. Um, so, which one's the next slide? It's not advancing. Um, oh, sorry. So, um, we have a very different population in um, our metals superfast center. So uh, Native Americans in the Western United States might be at higher risk of um, metals exposure from the abandoned uranium mine sites. Um, so out of the 4,000 abandoned uranium mines in the Western United States, uh, there are about 500 AUM sites on the Navajo Nation alone. Um, so we have found AUM exposure has been associated with increased likelihood of cardiovascular disease, having multiple um, chronic disease, uh, higher autoantibiotic production in older population, and a higher risk of preterm birth, autoantibiotic, um, and chronic inflammation in a uh, younger population. And so this is the map showing where the Navajo Nation study population is located in the United States, around the um, four corner region. Um, so, so uh, besides abandoned uranium mines, there are other sources of, or pathways of potential metal contamination. Uh, the largest being power plants and coal mining. So there are large, two large coal burning power plants in the northwestern portion of the Navajo Nation. And there's also <laughs> a lot of trash burning, indoor heating sources. So um, a lot of uh, just fire burning, and then. Um, a more, um, I guess, pronounced one or a way to elevate that exposure would be through occupational. So direct um, exposure, there are mine workers or a, a legacy of mine workers and then um, ore haulers and then that's followed by the people who reclaim the mines. Um, and people who worked in mines would also then bring contaminants home on their clothing. 
And so there's indirect exposure to other family members of their homes. Um, um, and I just want to just give you a visual representation of the breadth of the Navajo Nation. So you saw in the map, it's really large. It's about 25,000 square miles. Um, and it covers some upper meadows and, and some forested areas, as you can see in the top left photo, but is also largely dominated by these lower desert tundra landscapes with sandstone. But one of the uh, prevalent like geophysical realities of most of the Colorado Plateau uh, is, is dust storms. So this is a, a photograph I snapped of a dust storm in front of a uranium mine tailings pile. It's about 100 feet tall, the tailings pile, uh, for those of you here, is about the, the height of those blue mountains. Um, so that's about 100 feet right there. And these dust storms are prevalent and everywhere and huge, really. So um, they also, they impact the communities. Uh, there's really small, very rural communities. So this is an image in the bottom right of a uh, community center just uh, downstream from the, the Church Rock Mine Spill in 1971. So they're still experiencing the, the ramifications of this environmental contamination. And you'll have to excuse my, my pronunciation. Uh, Lizo in the Dine language is uranium, and Duda is no, or it really, like forbidden, verboten, strong no. So. And this is a conceptual model of our metals um, team. So uh, the overarching question is where are the exposure coming from? Um, so we have uh, two environment projects and uh, two biological projects. So basically we, want, we try to understand where the exposure come from. And then uh, and one of the environment project is to uh, understand how the mine waste uh, became mobilized in the air. Um, and then we also uh, explore other exposure routes, pathways, for example, the through air, and then how the water might, um, how the mine waste might um, move from uh, water to plants as well. So um, in biological projects, we're trying to um, understand association between the environment exposure and the toxicological mechanisms uh, in our population. Um, and also, um, we try to, um, based on those understanding, so we will do um, and how, how this is gonna inform the risk reduction strategy, intervention, and then remediation. And then just remember, all of our work is in partnership with our ind ind indigenous communities. So, okay, mass balance model, I'm, and I'm not gonna talk about <laughs> more about mass balance model, but the, the uh, point of this slide is just to show because our overarching goal of the metal superfund center is to identify where the exposure come from and the mass balance model um, is able to identify and solve this question for us. So that's why we're using the map. We are hopefully we will be using the mass balance model working together with you guys. And then like, um, so we, we hope to identify, um, better understand other exposure routes <coughs> besides water. Can I ask you, so what's your horizontal axis going to be? And it, it's going to be several axes. I think. Right, right. Yeah. So our horizontal Will, will be not just the well mm -hmm. water or snake. So we might have the so the very low percentage of people actually use water from unregulated water well. But we actually so the next slide actually we will talk about the the water the like water sources for for the population. Yes. So, so what is what, what would be the horizontal axis? Like, so so that will be the community water we we. We just actually compile I mean, what, what's together. The measured, measured um, dose or indicator. Uh, well, we have the same units of water, um, similar across the, the centers, but we also have dust wipes. Um, so we have we have arsenic. Right now, it's um, micron per square meter. Uh, square meter of uh, really square uh, square meter of dust, essentially, like the, the like a thin layer of dust. Like if you wipe a surface or, or something. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So so if you like swab a surface in someone's in someone's home? Yeah, so okay. uh, the, the group would go around and swab the tops of dressers or shelves or kind okay. of windowsills. And so we, we have dust samples for, for each of our homes. But you're not yet converting that to how much they actually ingest it. Correct. But, but 
but that's what she if, if you're doing it and if you're not doing that properly the mass balance will tell you essentially mm -hmm. that that will be the key yeah. part i reviewed a while back a paper for esnt it was from africa with a dust problem mm -hmm. and they were measuring inert things mm -hmm. in the feces like scandium and so so that could be your tracer of dust mm -hmm. if you know something that's not going to be you know mm -hmm. absorbed in the body or something like that so that mm -hmm. might be useful I think the Navy and yeah. also. Mm -hmm. that's right. Yes. Something that yeah, you can trace to quantify the actual right. dust. It would allow you to, if you measure that in your wipe, then you can use that ratio essentially to, to get into the dose part. Right. But, but you have to get feces. So that's really not so easy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It may be necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this is our um, population. So um, our population will be based on one of our study. It's called um, Navajo First Cohort Study. Um, so we, we will get um, most of our biomonitoring data from this mass Navajo uh, NBCS. So the goal of the study is to better understand the relationship between the uranium exposure and the first outcome, early development delay, Navajo Nation. So uh, we get the biomonitoring data uh, from the study, but also we have the home environment assessment, including the indoor dust radon um, uh, survey, and also uh, drinking water. But um, so actually, the drinking water uh, we actually primarily get from another source. So this is a um, based on the overall overall data we have. Um, so it shows uh, all of the other possible exposure source. So we, as you can see, um, the drinking water, um, there are actually relatively low percentage of people with drinking water standards ex exceeding the MCL. Um, and then over 60% of the homes have dust, um, have like metals found in their dust, um, including arsenic, uranium, manganese. Um, so this is why uh, we are thinking um, maybe other source besides the water. We can is, the ra is radon in the house the daughter product of the same uranium isotope that is in the dust? Um, that's complicated. So I mean, they, they would, a lot of a lot of the time before the there was a rich understanding of, of the risk of using rocks for mines. Those were used to construct homes. Uh, oh, okay. And so there's a lot of potential pathways of, of irradiation. Because um, if it was if it was just coming from the dust, it'd be a great indicator of how much dust is in the house. Yeah, but it's it's not that easy. It's not. <laughs> um, I also want to note that for all community water systems in the U.S., only about four percent that have an exceedance above the MCL. Mm -hmm. So while twelve percent might seem low, it's actually much higher compared to. The rest of the US, so I think water is more yeah. relevant here than yeah. in other communities. Um, and we're, I mean, absolutely, but we also think that it's maybe not necessarily a huge portion of of the Navajo population <laughs> still. I mean, it's it's outside, it's much larger um, than the national average. So about 30% of people living on Navajo don't have piped in water. So to, to mitigate that, there's a lot of hauling water. Um, there is also uh, <coughs> drinking from wells. So the, the map in the bottom left shows arsenic concentrations. <coughs> the red circles are exceedances above the MCL. Uh, and the top right is uranium concentrations. Uh, and so that, those are also exceedances. The MCL of uranium is, is 30. Uh, micrograms per liter. So um, what we what we see is that there is some hauling from or from wells, some drinking water from wells. We often also see people hauling drinking water from regulated public water systems, often up to a hundred miles away. Um, so they'll they'll drive from really rural rural area um, down in the the eastern agency to. Um, to Flagstaff, for example, and so that that's a really large, large distance. Um, then we also uh, see there, there's some complication in in reporting the levels of, of metal contaminants in these consumer confidence reports that are released um, for every public water system. And so with anti-self, we kind of 
work to address that, but I'm going to let her speak about it because she's probably a lot more versed in, in how to describe it. So um, this is all of the species of um, the heavy metals found. Um, so basically the key points here are the total ars urine arsenic, um, a little bit slightly below the US population in general. Um, so, but the inorganic arsenic, arsenic three is actually a lot significantly higher than the US population in general. And then we have significant less exposure to um, organic arsenic um, so um, we think that's probably because of different uh, dietary source and exposure source. So Navajo Nation uh, don't really have uh, rice or fish as their primary diet. And then um, so other exposure sources we mentioned might include um, the um, AUM sites, uh, the coal fire uh, power generation stations, and then also the indoor heating, which rely on as well. So those are probably um, some of the primary uh, contribution or source of uh, inorganic arsenic. I just have a comment going back to the mm -hmm. previous conversation about radon and proposal from uh, Zoltan Zabel, who's uh, mm -hmm. radon has sources from local soil gas and degassing from local well water also. So radon should be low from cold water degassing during the transport. Just what is the notion of what so that it's uh, like half a standard deviation above the mean um, the organic arsenic yes yes what, what is that like what value is it so that's compare compared to the um, so the blue bar indicates significant um, so so that mean I think it's the um, enhanced population, which is the yeah. National Health uh, Nutritional Exam uh, Examination Survey. That's yeah. representing so what, What's the I, All I know is just one Bangladesh data set. So, oh, the average yeah. in enhanced for inorganic arsenic is below okay. the undetectable. The average what? It's undetectable. And so it's below, uh, below, and the, the so limit of detection for arsenide in, in enhanced I believe it's one or point uh, is over time, but it's yeah. high it's one point two. It's, it's a little horrendous limit of detection. Like in, in our lab here, we have covered one. So Enhance has crazy limit of detection. I'm not sure why. And so what they are doing is that they're replacing that one, that is the limit of detection by the square root of two, so point four, point four five or something like that. So they are comparing their levels in the Navajo Nation to that 0.45 that is the average in a, in a Haines. So here they are a 0.5 standard deviation higher yeah. from and I, I from the so from, from the average. But in, what is that in, in micrograms per liter? It's 0.5. Point, point 0.5. 0.5 is micrograms per liter for inorganic arsenic in the unit. Yeah. So that's, and in that's the really, unit, that's, that's low. Very low, very yeah. low. And the total, because there's also a reference to the total, you know, for the total? The total is around seven. seven. Okay. Okay. Liter, but the total in enhanced that is around seven, primarily is seafood arsenic. Yeah. And this is why here you have, even in the, in the Navajo Nation, you have lower arsenic total than the US, but you have higher in organic. And the reason is because they eat so little seafood, and as soon as you eat, you eat a shrimp, and you have a little bit of tuna in your salad, mm -hmm. your arsenic levels are 100 microns per liter. There is so much arsenic in seafood that that's why mess up everything <laughs> in, in populations that eat seafood. Because the, the, the exposure levels of the organic arsenic are huge as compared to the inorganic arsenic that is tiny. I mean, here's really, all yeah, I know is that they are not. Yeah, 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 I'll still eat seafood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is so low compared to yes, what we're eating. Yes, very low. Yeah. So, you'll see, you'll see more. Yeah, so why, why is it even a problem? Like, it's still like, a problem. Yeah. It's still a problem. Because in Bangladesh, if you were this low, then you are just, you know, yeah. you have the least dose and but again, I am, mm -hmm. this is the same thing I am mentioning, that yeah. I mentioned earlier with, yeah. with lead. If everybody is exposed to these yeah, high yeah. levels, you don't understand the yeah. health impact. Yeah. Because 
that looks like normal. Doesn't mean it's normal. So these are urine concentrations, and how many mothers are in this? Uh, um, the about MCS mothers. 800. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so <laughs> if you are drinking the MCL of 10 micrograms per liter, and you um, uh, evaporated what's typical, like half, then you would expect to have 20 micrograms right. per liter in your urine, just roughly concentrated that much. And this is all much less. Than, you know, so this would be sort of that rough calculation equivalent to drinking five micrograms per liter. Yeah, well, and you'll, you'll see yeah. that our um, our detected levels of arsenic from the, the water sources that our population is drinking from aren't super high, uh, especially compared to Bangladesh. So, I mean, they, they go up on average to maybe 13, 15 micrograms per liter. But on average overall, what, what is, is it around five? Um, I can't remember what yeah. the average is, but it's below the MCL. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's consistent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah, so we have other uh, environmental projects ongoing to um, understand if my waste to move through water, uh, move from water to plants and livestock, eventually to human. So one of the study um, in the Superfund Center is to actually find out um, the calcium is very efficient to control the uptake, plant uptake of uranium. Um, so uh, another study, we also found um, there's high problems for mine waste and mineral occur not all particle size fraction, uh, and uh, not all particle can move directly from a lung into the bloodstream without being dissolved. So, um, and then just remember, almost all of the uranium um, in the study area in present, uh, in windblown uh, mineral dust is the respiratory resp form that will go deep into the lungs. And then so this picture below, lower left, shows you uh, it's a surface soil contaminated with high abundance of respirable um, grain. Many of them are nanoparticle, which is less than the PM size. And they're easily transported by even live winds. Yes. I have a rather big picture question, and maybe I am just lacking context. But yeah. the, the mass balance model, while we developed it for arsenic, it doesn't, it's, there's nothing special about arsenic, except there are a few special things. It can't it can't be transformed in the body in a way that you can't track it anymore, which is kind of what we were talking about with the organic versus inorganic and things like that. But I would imagine that there are other metals like arsenic that may be present at your site that this could be relevant to. So I'm just curious, like, why the focus on arsenic? Is that, yeah. Well, I mean, that's specifically because of this, this EUC or external use case. And we, we just started talking about arsenic. I think that Largely in our in our cohort, we're interested in uranium. Um, and they're and co-located usually. They they are yeah. very significantly co-located. Right. Uranium gets so small. I mean, there's research we don't really know. And the vanadium of uranium in the body co-located with uranium yeah. in the particle. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we, we do have information about a bunch of other metals, but we were just really trying to harmonize the the data set. Just really like arsenic too. But, but you might learn about your mass balance with respect to this ingestion by looking at other elements too. So yeah. you may not want to separate that question from, from mm. the other. So. Yeah. So here comes to, to, to the research objective of this UUC is really to understand, you know, so the take home point is, you know, the very small percentage of people drink water ex exceeding the MCL. Um, and then the proximity to the AUM sites or the water concentra concentration, arsenic concentration in water past way are not really sufficient to explain the individual level by monetary results. Um, so we, we, we believe besides water, there are other exposure routes like air dust. So basically the goal of this UC or UNM metals is really to work together with um, Columbia University to um, identify the contribution of other exposure routes um, using the mass balance model, or maybe modify the mass balance, existing mass balance model. So that's the goal. And so, as I as I had alluded to before, um, 
this is just a kind of a, a code book of our data set that we harmonized to work with with the groups today. But um, water arsenic uh, in here on the top, we can see the, the minimum and maximum levels. The maximum level that we see in our population is 13.15 micrograms per liter. So considerably lower than, than the Bangladeshi cohort. So the um, units are wrong, no? Just yeah. for clarification. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, and then uh, uranium gets up to 65.6. Um, we also have three, we, we have a lot more dust wipe data broadly, for large than this, but I pulled arsenic, uranium, and, and manganese, manganese for this data set. That's measured in um, microgram per square meter. So if we need to think about the inhalation rate, we'll have to do some conversions. We also modeled um, ambient air concentrations. Um, so that is measured in nanograms per cubic meter. So we have uh, a modeled ambient arsenic and uranium. If you want to kind of say about, I, I may be wrong, but I imagine that dust is pretty homogeneous in the relative amounts of the different elements. Um, mixes in the atmosphere. And, yeah. So if you have this multiple element idea, then um, could really help nail things down. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know, the end, if you're inhaling dust, you get a, everyone gets the same proportion of elements coming in. The question is, how much dust do they get? Right. right. So, yeah, it's less homogeneous than you might think, especially if you, where you have local house sources, indoor air pollution mm -hmm. sources like mm -hmm. smoke. The smoke is probably half of the indoor indoor air pollution in many of these households. Okay, but that, that won't change the ratio of the different elements. That it will. Out because that has its own composition that's different than the external. Oh, so it has, the smoke has uranium and arsenic Absolutely, yes. yeah. from the coal. Okay, I got it. Coal or wood. There's Indoor heating. Yeah, we, the other, other exposure source. We're trying to make it easier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can start with the easy one. <laughs> um, oh, oh, we go back one. So here are our biomonitoring uh, data. So we have urine arsenic, total urine arsenic, um, and then creatinine, and then we have the speciation of arsenic uh, among our cohort of 579 pregnant mothers is who are we're looking at now. Um, and then we also have some blood. So we have lead, manganese, and selenium in blood um, as potential outputs. Unfortunately, I see that you measured the arsenic at the CDC lab. We did. That, that yes. has, it's, unfortunately, the CDC lab is great for all the elements in the world except arsenic. Because right. they are using a unit of detection that is 10 times higher than what we do here in our lab, or that Margaret is doing, Ryan Jackson is doing in her lab. So mm -hmm. I am not sure why. And it adds a lot of problems to the epidemiological studies because now mm -hmm. you have a lot of undertakes. We have a, a considerable amount of undertakes in, in different. So I am I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because it adds you another problem. But anyway, right. it's a great lab otherwise. But I, I don't recommend them for our center. And finally, um, just some, some other confounding data. So we have some sociodemographic information, marital status education link, um, and then uh, coded uh, smoking status, um, zero, one, or two. Uh, zero for never having smoked, one for having quit, and two for current smoking. Uh, age and uh, body mass index calculated from uh, the height and weight, and then systolic and diastolic. Yeah, that cannot be. That's not useful for typo. Really good. Maybe 21. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe something is wrong. I don't know the weight, the weight, the weight and right. the height are wrong. So we ran some preliminary statistics yesterday, um, and then we found very weak association between the water arsenic and the total arsenic in the urine. So it's very weak compared to the Bangladesh population. And then the arsenic-3 um, is higher than, you know, the arsenic-3 urine is higher than the U.S. population in general. So we ran the statistics and then found no significant association between the arsenic-3 in the urine and the water arsenic, actually. There's no correlation. At all. And that so could likely be because of the, the other effects. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah.
When you said the dust pipe, sixty-one percent had metals in it. Mm -hmm. Like, what criteria? Like, how high does the metal have to be for you to put it into that category? Yeah, that's just, just some measurements. Um, yeah. Actually, no. That's um, so that figure doesn't actually show uh, relatively how high they are compared to the standards. So it just show like over sixty percent of the homes identified. Dust. Uh, identify the metals in the dust, so that didn't. But it doesn't actually. say which metals are whether they're, if they're black. Yeah, that's that's just it's a really crucial the other right, right. just right. detection of heavy metals. It's just metals. detection. Um, and then and then in the data it's broken. Yes. Have you been able to like identify the different differential levels of exposure or resolution, like where it is online? Uh, yeah, so uh, for people online, the, the question was whether or not we've been able to identify different uh, regions of exposure. And and yes, there are, there are some, our group has done some research, and I, I wasn't involved in it, so I don't want to, you know, give wrong information. But there, there we have shown that there are clusters of different um, uh, health outcomes related proximally to the uranium mining. So yes, yeah. um, and I'll share those papers with you. Yeah. Almost constant, it seems. Yeah, I, I was, uh, it was one of the first times I had gone out there. Uh, I was actually um, just off the reservation and speaking with somebody about this tailings pile and, and she was telling me, these dust storms happen all the time and within 10 minutes, like clockwork, it just whipped right up. It's a it's a very dry area and it's it's flat for the most part and so it just you, you see a lot of wind blowing across those western plains and the, the Colorado. Do they have a reference for Yes. Is that is so, the high is that karma? The coral states karma there has a very high burden of uh, interstitial lumps. The, the uranium is also quite soluble because mm -hmm. because it's area is one of the reasons why the dust can form. The solubility right. from the work we did in the four corners was like 80 percent, like literally just instantly fell off the solids and mm -hmm. got them wet. So. Yeah, 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 so it's higher, it's higher in the solid. Do they grow crops or food there? Because, yes. Uh, I mean, and how, does these heavy metals get incorporated? Yeah, so there is one of the environmental projects uh, the Superfast Center is to do the plant study. Yeah, so um, they have done, and I'm not involved in that project, but they, they do the plant study. And then, so the one of the slides I show is the calcium is very effective in control, controlling the uptake of uranium in the plants, actually. Um, my last question, I don't know if this would be the same age, like the trends are the same age, like arsenic or the alchemist. But uh, for like livestock that are yes. know, ready, like, right. drinking the water or whatever. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's that. a very good question. Yeah. Is that part of the master's model? Uh, it's not part of the, the model now because it's right. an ongoing project that we're, we have we're working on. Funded by EPA. So we are, we are working on projects, especially in coal, actually, because the livestock. So um, understanding the exposure to. Um, Ex uh, the cumulative exposure in the livestock. So to working together with community college and then another university, um, and then finally to understand the relationship um, of exposure from the environment to the livestock and then to humans. So that's another topic. I, I wouldn't even think that. I wrote a whole lot of students. I don't think a lot of people grow crops. Um, um, yeah. Now a lot of the agriculture um, is feed for for livestock. Because there's a growing concern about grazing in U AUM impacted watershed. And so, yeah, we don't really know yet. Okay, so thank you. And let's move to Chile now. And Andreas is going to, to present. 
And I know we have some colleagues from Chile. I don't know if they're still there, but uh, feel free to uh, ask questions and contribute to the discussion. Yeah, so Sandra got this earlier. And turn, turn that, I need to see what, oh. what's going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> okay, right here. Right. Come on. This is quite remarkable. Do you have the presentation more? No, I don't. Okay. Come on. Just join up there. It's okay. <laughs> Oops. It yeah, looks good. Now. Okay. Yeah, You're I can good. see it that way. Okay, it's good. Thank you. Hold on, I'm so sorry. It's showing the wrong way. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I'm here representing the Arsenic and Health Effects Research Group from UC Berkeley. So just as a disclaimer, I just came on board on this project and many of you are probably more familiar with the Chile data than I am. So please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But um, so the PI of this project is Greg Steinmaus and, you know, Alan, working with Alan Smith as well and super fund director uh, Martin Smith. Uh, so I just came on board in this supplemental project and hopefully we'll be working with the super fund center over there for, for a little bit longer. So I just wanted to give you a really brief overview of the study design so we can think about how we can incorporate our data. So this is data from Chile, specifically from regions uh, one and two of Chile. And the data that I'll be presenting today is uh, specifically coming from Antofagasta, um, a region in Chile that is pretty uh, dry. Um, and therefore, they, you know, we have a really nice ecological, uh, epidemiological design. So. This is what happened in this region in Chile uh, from 1930 up to 1957. Uh, they had a source of drinking water that had pretty low levels of, of arsenic exposure um, for the entire, uh, most of the entire city of Antofagasta. And then in 1958, 58, they actually switched water sources to a river that had pretty high levels of arsenic, I believe at 160 micrograms per liter. So we had, you know, they had an entire population exposed to extremely high levels from 1958 all the way to 1970, where they actually realized about the problem and installed a treatment plan uh, in 1970. So uh, they have been able to leverage this data as an ecological design where you have people that have been exposed, um, highly exposed as adults, uh, and then you have individuals that perhaps were exposed prenatally to pretty high levels of uh, uh, arsenic in their drinking water. And then after the treatment plan was installed, then you get this other cohort that could, put, you know, that was potentially exposed to much lower levels of, of drinking uh, arsenic in their drinking water. So it really provides a really nice design with the caveat that, you know, they don't have uh, biomarkers into the past. So they're using this historical water data that Chile uh, nicely collected in this, in this region of Antofagasta. And really the study has been looked in at, at adult versus early life exposures or prenatal exposures. So, the data that we have uh, particularly among um, for biomarkers of arsenic, so this is all historical water data, but they did conduct a case control study. So this just adds a little bit more complexity to the data. We have 630 uh, study participants uh, from this region in Chile with urinary arsenic, and that was collected between 2007 and 2010. And then if you remember this plot, um, the water levels were, were already coming down at least uh, in that region of Chile with this some differentia uh, differentiation between different uh, municipal water sources. So in this case control study, uh, there are 347 controls. So these are individuals that are free of cancer and they were uh, matched to these 283 cases uh, that include 118 bladder cancers, uh, 68 kidney cancers, and 97 lung cancer cases. Could yeah. Non-health scientists, could you explain what a case control study is? Yeah, so so basically, you know, they were interested in to see if his, the historical exposure to arsenic in drinking water was associated with an elevated risk of cancer, um, because it's difficult to kind of uh, go out and, and, and collect data. And at the population level, they really focus on individuals that already had cancer. And I believe uh, particularly they were really interested in the lung cancer and bladder cancers uh, initially. So they recruited cases so individuals that had cancer at that uh, point in time, and then they tried to match them to individuals that kind of looked like them in terms of sex, SES, uh, hopefully geographical locations and, and some other things. So 
try to you know try to have a control group that looks as much as the cases as possible um, without regard to the exposure so exposure is actually the interesting part here uh, so we have urinary samples from this uh, case control study um, uh, for both they're, they're all exposed they're all exposed exactly and, and they were potentially all exposed so if you go back in time here they were potentially exposed to differential levels uh, based on this historical exposure too so they were really interested in the latency of, of the health effects of arsenic exposure. So how do you know what their exposure was? Uh, because they actually have place of residence uh, okay. historically, and then they were able to match it to water records as well. Okay, so this mm -hmm. um, river water diverted didn't go everywhere. For the entire city, at least for the region, if I'm correct, hopefully. Antofagasta, yeah. Okay, but then if the control were also happened. from there, they would Exactly, they would have had very similar exposures. Yes. So did they take the control from somewhere else, or? Uh, so I believe the controls um, they were also from that region, but potentially could have been um, differentially exposed depending on the region where they were. This is on average the water levels, but different municipal districts could have had different yeah. levels. Yeah. Uh, okay. So there's definitely a range. Not you know, it's not that everyone gets the same. And I'll show you the data for yeah, and yeah. You could map what you, you could figure out what those levels had been. Mm -hmm. in the into the past exactly that's the design that they have and i was able to look back into their data and there's definitely differential exposure uh, and i believe it's probably municipal source of, of water um but yeah with the caveat that you know potentially people could have been drinking from other sources as well so hopefully this mass balance model could help us so, so people mm -hmm. so the arsenic levels in the water had been measured in the past at the city level at the municipal level even, yes even when people were getting these really high exposure, uh, they knew what it was. No, that, I think they must have done that retrospectively. Yeah, retrospectively. But then they knew, mm -hmm. they did it at the end. In 19, go back to the figure, in 1970, mm -hmm. when they realized they had this big problem because yeah. of uh, arsenic poisoning, skin lesion, a lot of high burden of disease, it was a huge outbreak yeah. in that city. So then they said, what's happening here? And they measure the arsenic at the, at the, in the 70s, they find these very high levels of arsenic. Mm -hmm. And they knew that the water arsenic, they knew when they had diverted the, the river into okay. the town, and they kind of assumed that for that, those 12 years, the exposure levels have been constant at the okay. very mm -hmm. high levels. Okay. So, so it's not that they, they don't have, and the, yep. the past historical, <coughs> I think it must be some kind of estimation. From the previous source, might yeah. Have some measure Okay. On the, based on the people's source mm -hmm. where the water was coming from, they must have done that in the past, mm -hmm. but I assume that the water hadn't changed much because okay. it was the same source. So, this river water diversion mm -hmm. happened at the same time, shifted arsenic. Totally, dramatically. Yeah. dramatically. And then, it, then the idea is it sort of stayed the same mm -hmm. until they. Uh, but even much higher than in Bangladesh. So, the levels yeah. are at the very, very high end of Bangladesh. Yeah. Affecting a city of 300,000 people. So, okay. quite a large city. Yeah. Everybody's going to be extremely high mm -hmm. levels. The river was anthropogenic sources. Okay. Yeah, not sure occurring. That's, that was my impression. Yeah. Somewhere along the line. Right? I mean, it <laughs> maybe, <laughs> it, maybe <laughs> goes from mine to yours. It's very well. It's a very rich area. Yeah. 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 But I don't think it was <laughs> pollution of the river. Okay. But there, there's probably mm -hmm. some uncertainty in that. Like it, it didn't oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Years. There is a lot of uncertainty. Right. There's a lot of exposure misclassification here. Uh, and I think on average, it's relying on the large numbers of the population. Hopefully, they, they can overcome that. But, but yeah, you're right. There's, and this is the reason why they started collecting urine arsenic in the case control study. But, you know, that's a little bit too late, you know, because if you're looking at latency. <laughs> What's clear if you go back to the slide. Mm -hmm that the children born a few years before versus the children born in the 12 years mm -hmm. earlier, they were exposed to totally different levels mm -hmm. in Utah. Mm -hmm. So despite the errors and uncertainty, mm -hmm. that differential exposure was there. Mm -hmm. And that's why it can be scored particularly valuable to understand what happens if you are mm -hmm. born and you are a young child during those 12 years, as compared to just the 12 years before, and the 12 years later. Mm -hmm. So that, that's very, that's what mm -hmm. power of this cohort. Yeah, really I mean, it was a very unfortunate event, but it provides a natural experiment that we call it in epidemiology. Um, it would have 
was yeah. I think most people are. That's yes. the way they present the study. That right. people are drinking from the municipal water, right. but there are no private wells. And my understanding is a, it's a region that is very dry, so it's not like there's multiple sources of drinking water. It's basically, you know, they needed to get water to this region, and this is the reason why they diverted the river. So, so the control for the case is our people were just as exposed, it's just that for whatever reason, they didn't show the cancer. Or, or maybe there's mm -hmm. some small towns. Well, that, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> because there are four towns involved. Yes. Yeah, so there are four towns involved, and there are all cases and controls are much on age, what makes it a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. But um, I think they also asked them where do they drink the water from. They have some information. Right, and they also had information on how long they lived in the city. So there were people that moved out and could have moved in back then. So they have migration in and out from the cases and controls as well. And there is some variability. Yeah. Uh, but the way that the studies are published is a little bit confusing because sometimes they say that there is no variability. <laughs> okay. Right. And it depends on the region too. So that's that's why the studies might be a little bit confusing. For Antofagasta, they can assume this model, but then when you include more regions, there's more variability as well. Uh, but for the case control study, most of them came from Antofagasta. So we have urinary biomarkers for total urinary arsenic, MMA, DMA, arsenobetaine, arsenic 3, so arsenite and arsenate as well. We have urinary specific gravity as well as uh, urine creatinine too. And we do have, uh, this is something that Craig mentioned, we have about 1,500 more samples. So we have them in the lab, but we do not have arsenic measurements from these samples. So, mm -hmm. so the early work compared ecologic, mm -hmm. compared region one to region five or whatever it was. Right. With, with an area that had no, no arsenic problem. Is, are the controls taken from a different geographic region? I believe not. I believe they were from Antofagasta too. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think what for the purpose of the today's activity, mm -hmm. the data that we have now is collected now. Yeah. These are the urinary arsenic levels that they have now, not what they had in the past. Right. These are collected now with the water sample that they are drinking now. So let's forget about the very high levels they had in the right. past or whatever. Yeah, what I matters see. to the mass, mass value value is today. Right, today for urine okay. arsenic. But in case someone wanted to use the data I, there, I, yeah. I yeah, like. Well, I'll show you the data, but yeah, they're still individuals of, you know, 40, 50 micrograms oh. per liter. So yeah, it's, the problem wasn't completely resolved. Uh, and just, you know, just to put the idea in your head, because we do have, for every single individual, we have historical exposure based on year uh, reported arsenic measurements. And I believe they, they started measuring somewhere around here when they realized there was a problem. So for every, any given individual, we can go back in time for every, you know, yearly to see what their potential source of drinking water arsenic exposure was. So similar to the code book that um, Anna sent for heels, we also have demographic information. We also have water intake. So I think potentially we would like to use this. So they did an FFQ and we have very detailed water intake in terms of whether people were drinking um, bottled water or, or type of, uh, you know, they were drinking tea or coffee. So we have daily water intake from different sources. So I think that might be an interesting application as well. Uh, we also have their current arsenic concentration while well in their tap water with the proxy that is municipal source, right? So we didn't measure right at the, at the source of the household. And we, you know, I think one of the strengths is that we have extensive FFQs and dietary information. So, and that might be a, a good um, source potentially. So here we have the historical drinking water arsenic level. So then again, it's from 1920 to 2010, but for the urinary biomarkers, we only have them for the most recent case control studies. So we have them for 2007, 2008, 2009, and 2010 as well. Um, so this is the most recent uh, urinary uh, levels for the interview year. So we did look at correlation. So yesterday we're looking a little bit uh, and the correlation, and this is a Spearman correlation, that the relationship doesn't appear to be very linear. So if you were to do a regular Pearson correlation, that was fairly null, but we got a correlation of about 0.12 uh, between you know, the municipal reported water at the time of interview or urine collection, and then the actual total urinary arsenic. So it's not as strong as the HEALS data, but uh, we still have a, a signal there. Uh, what you can see here by tertile. So, you know, someone asked about the distribution of exposure. So here we have individuals that were exposed to potentially less than one up to 36.3 micrograms per liter, 
37 to 40 and 48 up to 60. So our range goes from like literally zero all the way up to 60 micrograms per liter. And you can see here in terms of urinary arsenic levels, you can kind of, you know, the dose response relationship is not as, as, uh, as um, I would say as indicative as the HEALS data, but you can kind of see that, you know, increasing water levels leads to higher total urinary arsenic. Uh, this is part of the problem that we have. So I just wanted to make sure that, that you're aware we have very discrete water levels because we're not measuring at the individual household. You know, we have a bunch of people with one number, a bunch of people with one number. So these are very discrete levels of arsenic. Uh, all the way down to zero, we just added a very small constant so we could take the log of it. Uh, but you can see the median is somewhere around here, about 36 uh, micrograms per liter. So I, I believe most of the action that we're seeing, at least with the correlation, is in this range going from, from median levels to higher levels where you see the increase. Uh, if you were to fit a linear model, this is a, a lowest line. Okay, go back to the mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm amazed by the range of urinary arsenic. Concentration mm -hmm. given it's the low exposure group, it's got to tell you something. This is the seafood. This is mm -hmm. the seafood. Okay, oh, all right. So I think like, mm -hmm. you need to, what you, it will be nice to see this box plot okay. removing the, the seafood because probably you are going to discriminate a little bit better. I see. Guess, because all this very high yeah. uh, arsenic at the low level group is probably all the seafood. And probably these are the wealthier people who were talking about mm -hmm. this right. race, uh, ethnic, uh, SCF differences. Yeah. differences. And the healthy, the wealthy people are likely to be eating more seafood, mm. so they end up having right. this very yeah. high level. And not to forget, it is on the coast and right. mm -hmm. the local culture. Yes, a lot of seafood. So I think it mm -hmm. would be good for you to yeah. do maybe with the, the you know the residual model okay. or to to create a new urinary arsenic not derived from seafood. Mm -hmm. And my guess is that this correlation is going to improve. It should improve a little bit, time. right? Okay. Yeah, we were playing a little bit yesterday. We're trying to get the, you know, summing up the inorganic species, but you know whether that is sufficient or do we actually need to regress yeah, out there? Both. Yeah. Check what right. would be the best. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to do this just to compare it to the uh, Bangladesh data, since you know mm -hmm. you also have total of urinary arsenic as well as the UNM data. But we can definitely do. But uh, we don't have seafood problem. Consumption, right? Because they don't eat seafood. Okay. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. so does this mean that people relying on uh, these rich people who are eating seafood, they somehow managed to get much cleaner water? Well, you know, I actually found this in the data. I recently got this data and started, you know, last night we were kind of working on this, but I'll show you a regression table. So, so this is from a multivariate model. You can see here the effect of water <laughs> arsenic, uh, log transform. Uh, so this is a log log model and that was still significant, but uh, of course, one of the major determinants is log creatinine. So I think this is what added the most uh, explanation into the model due to urine dilution. So I we definitely need to take that into account. But I was very surprised to see we have two race categories, so European and non-European. So I'm guessing it's white versus not. And this is a strong determinant. So European um, uh, individuals of European descent have much lower levels of total urinary arsenic. And this is still including the potential fish consumption. So I'm not sure what's going on there. I, I need to go back to the PI and ask him, you know, the demographics of this city because, you know, why is their level so much lower compared to the rest of the population? And this is already controlling for water arsenic, which is kind of like the municipal source. So it's not, I don't think it's compounding by location maybe. So it must be like filter water or they're drinking out of bottles or there must be something going on. And I do think we have that information. So uh, I want to look into this a little bit further, but but yeah, that's interesting. But yeah, so I think our model definitely, I, I, I don't know if you mentioned creatinine, but I think we need to include it into the model. What is the uh, so this is just the change in um, the change in urinary arsenic per per variable here, per... It's a log, it's the log scale. So it's a mm -hmm. log change mm -hmm. in urinary arsenic for one unit. Log, log change, yeah. Okay, but making it log, you could remove the units issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, yeah. it's more because it's mm -hmm. not—it's very skewed. The outliers, the very skewed values, could be very influential. Right. Yeah. And and by doing it in the log scale, you remove all of that uh, kind of yeah. outlier influential impact. So creatinine is—I can interpret that as being the strongest predictor. Yep. Yeah. And that's what's. Yeah. Yeah. And after removing it, the R squared drops down to like 0.08. So it's definitely one of the strengths. Yeah. 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 Yeah
creatine. Oh, creatine, creatine. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, there you go, autocorrect, that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've talked about this. I'm like, oh, just make it happen. <laughs> that would be an interesting thing to add to her model. Yeah, and you can discuss it, I'm not sure why this is happening. Yeah. Well, it, it's, con it's conceptually a little difficult to figure out. I, I think it's important. But uh, we never did figure out exactly how the issue here. Hydration status. Yeah. Right. So, so, so if 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 everyone produced the same amount, which I know is true, right. then, then right. it would it would go. It up. might not be needed with the mass balance for the reason that on the expected value, on the average, mm -hmm. it doesn't change. So the coefficient of water arsenic to urinary arsenic is 0.13. Is the same yeah, with think, or without creatinine. I, I think you could learn things from it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm not saying that. This, not, so you, you, uh, I mean, I'm saying that on average, the expectation, the average value yeah. doesn't matter. It's not. It's not biasing the average. It it it's reducing the variability. Yeah. What the what the dilution does is adds a lot of measurement error and variability because some people mm. have very lot of water. Yeah. Uh, and and they have low arsenic because they drink a lot of water, and some people have very high arsenic because they didn't, didn't drink any water. Right. But on average, the, no, I, the average arsenic is actually the same. You could do maybe some okay. sort of more, like you could have um, high creatinine because you're not drinking much water. Right. Mm -hmm. right? That's why we use that ratio. Or you okay. could have high creatinine because you're sweating a lot. Uh, but it's the same. In the, it, it, not for the mass balance, yeah. but for us, it, it, yeah, but it would be for the mass balance. For the mass balance, it matters yeah. whether, the mass balance is whether it's a change in how much you drink or how much you're sweating. Yeah. And that, okay. in the mass, mass balance, to, balance, yes. And would a solution yeah. be that you can take the ratio as we do in EPI usually, you just mm -hmm. kind of divide the right. concentration of arsenic divided by creatinine? I don't know. I think that makes it more complicated for a mass balance. Right, right. So I think you would need to. I'm just making this up. So <laughs> it, it, so we were talking about treating uranium and arsenic. But we we do a mass balance of creatinine at the same time. Third, third, third equation. If you did this divide thing, it would just yeah, lose yeah, the error. Yeah, you consider third equation. Right. Yeah. If you think, but except the creatinine is, is generated inside in the body, the body. Right. so it's a bit different. The nice thing of creatinine, and this is why it kills it, that it's excreted constantly during over the during the day, during the 24 hours. There is no diurnal variation in creatinine excretion. And this is why it's so useful to divide anything that you have in the urine over creatinine, because the levels that you have in the urine do not change over the day. Yeah. So the ratio is going to be related to how much water you, you just drank. Or, or how much you just said that. Oh, yes. Right. But that doesn't <laughs> so matter. But, but does that vary how much, much how much people prescribe? I don't know. Man, I'm going to go That influences a lot too much how much water you drink because the more you sweat, the more you think. There's another dimension to your nerve threatening from Mary's work. It's a very powerful predictor of. Methylation of arsenic. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the creatine from which creatinine is derived is a methylation product, and it's the largest consumer of methyl group by far in, mm -hmm. in, for all the things in, internally that are getting methylated. So, so it's a consumer of methyl group and therefore influences methylation. So, in, in, in which could influence excretion then, excretion of the different species. Yeah. No, creatine, we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Creatine is this form of stored it's energy in muscle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you measure creatine. Creatine, yeah. yeah. When you break down creatine, you make creatine. Okay. So I have a, an, another question. Mm -hmm. So why is cancer, bladder cancer, <laughs> do you think, or has a negative coefficient than the real mm -hmm. lung? Yeah, the reference is the control. So, I mean, I, I included this because given that this is a case control study, I'm not sure what the cancer patients are on. If they are undergoing chemotherapy or maybe they have already, uh, you know, what stage in their cancer they might be. Uh, so I think there's other physiologically uh, relevant issues. Right. Water source water. Also, I didn't the P-value pretty high. Yeah, but, yeah. 
And I believe if you include into a univariate model, cancer deaths appear to be associated with urinary excretion of, you know, this is multivariate in taking into account age, BMI, and sex. So what was the extended variable? Urinary arsenic. Yeah, okay. So we're predicting total, total <laughs> urinary arsenic, yeah. And the R square is so high because of blood creatinine, but that's not, it drops down quite a bit if you don't put it in. Uh, so I think, you know, just, just thinking about how this data has been used in the past and what we want to do with it. So uh, what uh, Craig has been uh, looking into it is this uh, latency of, of exposure. So when you have your high exposure window here highlighted in blue, um, there appears to be a latency of about at least a few decades, if you will, of the uh, increase in, in cancer cases. So, you know, this is a challenge of, of doing um, cancer research is because, you know, you don't know the latency of the exposure to, related to the health mm -hmm. outcome. So we have the power to do that, to go back in time and, and look at those uh, exposure periods as well. So what do we want to do with this data? Of course, we want to apply the mass balance model, but I'm interested in the epigenetic signatures of uh, having high exposure to arsenic. So this is our external use case. Um, so definitely if anyone has other uh, arsenic and epigenetic data, they're on the line, we'll be interested in collaborating as well. And we, I think this question of identifying the, the major sources of exposures is really important. And we're in the low end, I, I, I would say we're probably in the medium end, not like the HEALS data where you have a lot of, uh, a big range. We're definitely, you know, right there below 50. So identifying the other contributors to uh, urinary arsenic will be important to us. Thanks. More questions to Andres? Oh, thank you. We, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then next, Annie is going to present. Very good. I'm just going to say a couple of things before we start. Okay. That's okay. Awesome. Um, why? why uh, I mean, it's a little bit off topic, but I'll tell you why it's so relevant and it's good to get your feedback. So, um, I was in Bangladesh again back in January, I think, recently. And um, and we learned there, I was there with Jack Willis, uh, an economist, we learned that the Bangladesh government uh, is uh, taking arsenic much more seriously now. And at the ministerial level, they have now allocated a billion dollars to rural water supplies in Bangladesh. And so it's their own tax revenue. Uh, obviously, the country is growing fast and has this revenue. And this is on top of the $240 million allocated a year ago now, why is Yusuf's uh, uh, presentation going to be uh, uh, very relevant is because as part of that package, one thing that is being planned is a new blanket testing program. I showed you the BOMWAS map of the 4.7 million uh, wells that are going to be tested. So in the next year or two, uh, 10 million wells, I would estimate, are going to be tested for this. This is not going to be done by sending water samples to you know, my lab or Joe's lab it's going to be done with a field kit. And so uh, what Yusuf is going to discuss is the pros and cons of using a field kit for this type of, of, uh, of campaign. Thanks, Lek. Thank you all. So I don't need to go into the introduction that mass spec uh, uh, give much more accurate measurements of arsenic and the field kit data uh, uh, field kit give the arsenic concentration that are sometimes not very accurate. And here I've shown a, a recent photograph from a paper that just got published. So this is a water sample. And when they sent it to, uh, to a lab and the arsenic concentration was measured by a mass spectrometer, the concentration was 113 plus minus six microgram per liter. But once they were tested by the field kit data, so it the yellow color kind of uh, lit up and uh, the range of the concentration is between 10 and 25 microgram per liter. So uh, field kit data are inaccurate, but they have been used very widely. And as Lex mentioned, uh, the Bangladesh government wants to use it uh, in the future. So we need to <clears throat> assess how good are these, especially given the fact that these field kit data are used for well switching. So more importantly, what we want to answer here in this uh, in this uh, in this war is to see if the values that we get from field kit data are the useful in in well switching uh, uh, program that we do. So uh, I will uh, go over uh, uh, some of the uh, approach that we have taken, and please feel free to stop me if you have some questions. So you can just go back. I mean, 
that statement yeah. is are often highly inaccurate. That's what the paper states, or is that what you state? The paper, uh, the ready at all paper, it says they're inaccurate. Uh, but often highly? I have to go right. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I think I will do that. Okay. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> the reviewer is right here. And I send it to you to read. <laughs> it's funny. So, uh, so uh, uh, what we have done here is that we have two data sets. Uh, why is this going? It doesn't want it. Yeah, you're in the mouse. Yeah, you're in the mouse. Yeah, you're in the mouse. Yeah, so we have uh, two data sets. The data set one consists of 900 paired kit and uh, ICPMS measurement data. And the data set two contains, consists of 6,595 accurate spectrometric measurements that I think uh, what uh, Brittany used also in her work. And the main question again here is that what are the effects of inaccuracies in kit measurement on the policy of well switching? So uh, for the first part, what we do is we calculate the, uh, the conditional probabilities of different kit categories given the true arsenic concentration. And in the second part, when we know what is the true arsenic concentration, and by true, I mean accurate, uh, assuming that the mass spec uh, measurements are accurate, the accurate arsenic concentration, what could be the most likely kit categories? In the third part, what we do here is that we ask people to switch well. Uh, for all the people who are using contaminated uh, arsenic wells, and we compare how much the arsenic exposure decreases if the switching is based upon the mass spec data, and if the switching is based upon the kit data. And finally, we do some analysis to show why and how kit measurements are useful and what are the challenges associated with kit measurements. So let's look at the paired spectrometric and kit measurement data. That's okay. Okay. So uh, here are the nine kit categories and, and the way kit uh, kit work is generally you go and 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 Lex or Charlie just correct me. I've never done this <laughs> measurement. So you go in the field, you use a test strip, and based upon the color of the test strip, you kind of tell what is the range of the actual arsenic concentration. So if it's light yellowish, it's low in arsenic, and as it the color turns to brown uh, to orange, the arsenic concentration is higher, and the highest arsenic concentration is for the brown color. And here again, these are the nine uh, uh, kit categories. So category one, the expected concentration should be zero PPB. So the, the yellow color should light up. But what we see here is that there's a range of values, the range of true arsenic concentration here. So it goes all the way from zero to, uh, to 25 ish. And again, this is in log scale, the Y axis. Similarly, if you look at the kit category three, the expected concentration should be close to 25 ppb, but the range goes all the way from zero to almost 100 ppb. So for each kit category, the actual range of true arsenic concentration is very large. And what we did is that we look at the distribution of each of these kit categories here, and we try to fit a probability distribution function to kind of calculate the, the density uh, of the true arsenic concentration uh, for different values. And here I've shown for uh, the category three and for category six in these two. So we have uh, fitted the distribution with a PDF. And in the next slide, I will show for all the nine different categories. So uh, here are the nine different categories. So the nominal concentration of arsenic in category one should be close to zero. And you can read through the different categories. So for this one, the last one, the nominal concentration of the kit should be 1000 ppb. So most of the well in this category should lie close to 1000 ppb. But we can clearly said, see that there is a range of true arsenic concentration for this kit category. So we have the marginal distributions for all the nine different kit categories. And one thing I want to uh, go is for all the wells. Yeah, you want to say? <laughs> uh, 
one thing i want to say that uh, for wells uh, that tests uh, positive for category 1 2 3 4 we put blue placards and green placards and what it means uh, on the tube well or on the well that these wells are safe to use and for wells that test positive from category 5 to 9 we put a red placard as you can see in the top photograph which means that these wells are not safe and people should avoid drinking water from these wells So now that we have all the distributions, we can actually calculate what is the probability of the different kit categories. And you can see there is a large overlap between the crew concentration for each kit category. So let's say I want to know if the true arsenic concentration of a well is 100 ppb, what are the probabilities of these nine different kit categories? And I've shown here, uh, I've highlighted the 100 ppb by a green line and you can see the density uh, for each of those uh, nine kit categories. And then I calculate uh, the probabilities associated <laughs> for the nine categories. So of course, when the concentration is 100 ppb or 100 microgram per liter, the probability associated with the first four kit category is very low, but five, six and seven is high. So when you go in the field, any of these kit category can test positive. Uh, when you when you know that the true arsenic concentration is 100 ppb so what are the implication of these differences we will discuss uh, later but uh, before i go uh, into those i want to show that instead of one value if we look at the range of the values how do they look like so here is on the x axis we see a true arsenic concentration and again it's on log scale going all the way from 0 to 1000 ppb and again, uh, in the top, what I've done is I've clubbed category one and two as blue color because whenever these two light up, we put a blue placard on the well. Uh, for category three and four, I've cl uh, clubbed them as green color because then we put the green placard. And from five to nine, it's uh, the red placard that are posted. So uh, uh, when the concentrations are very low, generally category one and two light up and the probability is very high, close to one. And then it starts to go down. And the good thing is, above let's say 25 ppb or 50 ppb the chances of putting a blue placard on the well is very low very low probability so it's good so you are not going to label a bad well as good uh, then we look at the category three and four again it's very low and then it starts to go up and it's highest at around 25 parts per billion and then it starts to go up and once again after around 100 ppb it's very very low so once again, if the well is very contaminated, you are not going to put a green placard that, okay, you can still use that well. And the fine. color is very high. What is the probability at 50 for this task? So the it's probability? Uh, 50 here, that right? sounds too risky. Well, what's too risky? No, relative to no information. Yeah. So yeah, I will, I'll probably. Yeah. And, 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 and they're and not strict with the green. But with the you know, essentially it's not quite, it's not a uniform distribution. That's exactly what you're going to discuss. Yeah. I can see why it worries you, but then when you consider the actually the spectrum of concentrations, then you will, you will false, really change your false, mind. Uh, well, a false not, positive, a false negative worries me. Yeah. You know? yeah. So. Uh, so it won't be blue. Okay. Yeah, it won't be blue, so that's, that's good. That's so that I think, that's... but that's what's important for the people to, because the green might teach you a false. Uh, but and that's maybe national policy. We, we had no choice there. We could yeah. not label. I think I would label that orange. No, so they like forbid that. us from doing that now, because then it would be inconsistent with national policy. We yeah. tried. But the risk, yeah. The blue looks great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, that's that's the, and, that's, and that's how you the, identify. The green, uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And the yeah, red yeah. looks great. I think the blue and the red wow. look great in general. This includes, by the way, potential areas of sample labeling. It's not only it's not only chemistry or visual. It includes all the areas. Well, all the areas in this period. In this period, yeah. yeah. Which is probably a very good. Well, it's ten women with high school education. High okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those under your supervision, uh, Columbia supervision. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, absolutely, you're right. So that's why I pointed here in this pink arrow. You know, uh, that for a concentration of, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm so sorry. So for the concentration of around like let's say 75 ppb, uh, there is a 
25% chance that that well could be labeled as green, which is a false negative. So you are saying that your well is okay to use, but it's not. And so uh, in the bottom graph, what I'm trying to show is that I've highlighted some region between 25 and let's say 75 ppb uh, area. And these are the regions where the misclassifications are higher, the highest. But the good thing here is that most of the misclassifications, misclassifications are false positive. So as you can see, the red, uh, the red um, line is going up and up. The probability associated with the red line is going up and the probability associated with the green line goes down dramatically. So yes, there are misclassifications. But how do they affect well switching is very interesting, as you will see uh, from the uh, from the results. Yeah, let me point out one thing. So you're concerned. I was more concerned about that before I saw this. I thought things would be worse. And what this is showing is that yeah, there's a really high probability that you're misclassifying your green if you're just barely red, mm -hmm. right? But so. If you're misclassified as being less than 50, um, well, put it this way, you, you're likely, there's a high probability to be misclassified as less than 50 if you're 50 watt. Right? Mm -hmm. but, but once you're up to uh, 100, in other words, if you were 49 from a health point of view, it makes yeah. no difference. But once you get up above 100, uh, it becomes. Yeah. Really, yeah. quite unlikely. Yeah. Like, one, like 100 is very high. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a very easy to have 100. So, the bigger problem is 50. Yeah, but it's a huge problem. 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 I think that's my problem. That's, that's exactly why there's good incentives to develop better kids. So, right? I, mean, I, I don't think we're going to do much about that. 50, 50 is an arbitrary question. I think it's the, the, yeah. the red was the blue. Yeah, yeah, let's keep moving because yeah. I have 12 minutes to leave the room. We go to the other room. I want Annie to present. Yes. So, uh, I, so the, the, the graph that I showed here, I just summarized that in a tabular form here. So if the actual concentration of a well is less than 10 ppb, there is a 72% chance that if you measure them by a kit, you will assign them a blue placard. There is a 27% chance that you will assign them a false positive, a green placard, and a very low chance of assigning them a red placard, which is also good. You don't want people not to use good wells. And if the concentration is between 10 to 50 ppb, uh, there is a 10% chance of false negative that will assign them a blue placard, 65% of correct assignment of green placard, and 25% of a false positive red placard. And for the most contaminated wells that are greater than 50 parts per billion, there is very less uh, chance of assigning them blue, which is again very good. Uh, there is 8% chance of assigning them green, which has its own challenges, and I will show in the results how they look like. But there is a 92% chance that you will assign them a red placard, which is again very good to hear. Even though, like I said, category 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, 9, uh, they have their own uncertainties in between. But because they are all assigned red placard, that's why we see we get such high probabilities associated with them. You should make put for the Columbia group. Um, up to this point in your talk, these results are all consistent with what Regine did. So some of you have probably. Maybe you haven't, but let's just not present okay. this. Not in this group. Not in this group. Okay. Okay. So now let's look at the, the simulated kit realization from the spectrometric measurement. So as I mentioned, I had another data set of 6,600 wells where the arsenic was measured using uh, by spectrometers. Now for each true value, because we had the probabilities of the different kit, uh, we got a, a realization of uh, of those kit uh, categories uh, and then uh, let's look at the results so this is the initial yield data so, so, so the, the model is yeah. applied to the initial yeah. yield so basically for all the probabilities that we have for a given true concentration we randomly choose what could be the most likely kit category that will uh, show up and again i don't need to explain the figure on the right side these are the true concentrations. We're not selecting the most likely category. 
if you're ge we're generating a random realization based on the different probabilities for each bit category. Well, you're including some errors. Well, well including there, some misassignments. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, the most likely is the one that it most often goes to. But the whole point is, is that it often doesn't go to the most likely. Well, sometimes it goes to the most likely. It's less than 50%. So, yeah, I hope it's not open. So yeah, I mean the left, fig the figure on the left side is what uh, Lex showed in the morning. So uh, all the wells less than 10 ppb are in blue, 10 and 50 are in green, and greater than 50 are in red. And these are uh, the the panel on the right is what I've got from the kit realization. So all the well uh, that were, for example, if I if I look if I put my mouse here, if this well was actually red. And it was assigned red by my kit realization. I called it correct and it's shown in white. But there are a lot of wells that were, of course, misclassified. So false positive. So if they were actually blue and classified as green and red, if they were green and they were classified as red are shown in purple and false negative in, uh, in brown or red color. So overall, less than 11% of the wells were assigned incorrect placards. And it might look... Um, more than 11 percent in this figure because that's how i've made it to so that it kind of comes out and uh, uh, most of the incorrect assignments were again between 20 and 70 ppb so the the most contaminated wells were not or the highly uh, the wells with high arsenic concentration were not misclassified there. so now the question is what is the actual exposure of arsenic in our eye hazard and how would this exposure change if we ask people to switch their wells based upon the spectrometric measurements, and if we ask people to switch based upon the, the less robust kit measurements that we have. And for this, what we did was we identified all the wells uh, with arsenic greater than 50 ppb. Uh, and then we found uh, wells within a hundred meter radius that are uncontaminated. And we asked people to switch to the well that has the lowest arsenic concentration in that hundred meter radius. In case there was no well within that 100 meter radius uh, that was less than 50 ppb, we asked them to switch to the well with the lowest arsenic concentration. And we did this exercise using both the actual correct spectrometric measurements and the kit realizations that we have. And here is a summary of that result. So before switching, the actual arsenic exposure of the entire population was 90 parts per billion, 90 micrograms per liter. If we switch the wells based upon a spectrometric measurements, the arsenic exposure went all the way down to 26 ppb. And if we switch the wells based upon uh, kit realizations, it went down to 36 ppb, which is slightly higher than a spectrometric, but still very good. Now let's divide that mean, you know, let's dive in deeper. Uh, so let's look at the number of wells we're actually actual arsenic exposure decreased from greater than 50 parts per billion to less than 50. So using a spectrometric measurements, almost 83% of the people who were using well, contaminated wells actually managed to move to an uncontaminated well. Around 15% of the people reduced their arsenic exposure, but it was still more than 50 ppb. Around 2% of the people could not switch their well because perhaps there was no well uh, within their 100 meter radius that had lower arsenic concentration. And if you look at the wells, uh, the same category using simulated kit categories, almost 67% of the people managed to reduce their arsenic exposure to less than 50. Uh, around 21% managed to reduce, but they were still higher than 50. And 11% were unable to reduce. So it's a bit higher than, uh, than switching based upon a spectrometric measurements. The one thing that I want to highlight is, is that around 1% or less than 1%, 45 wells, the arsenic exposure actually increased because of the uncertainties associated with the kit. And here is again the result. And uh, I'll quickly, very quickly go over it because I know we have time constraints. So on the x-axis is the actual arsenic exposure. The yellow bar shows pre-switching and the orange, uh, red and the green bar shows post-switching. So the red one is switching based upon a spectrometric measurement. So the actual correct measurements that we have, as you can clearly see, a lot of people, their exposure kind of went up uh, to very low arsenic uh, concentration. Uh, almost it doubled from uh, 2000 wells to almost 3500 wells. 
same with uh, the the simulated kit categories uh, the ex arsenic exposure decreased and all the slightly lower than the spectrometric measurements but in essence the main point is arsenic exposure decreased dramatically based upon switching either through a spectrometric measurements or through the simulated kit measurements that we have used here diving it a bit more deeper uh, and looking at the actual data for the 6595 wells that we have on the x axis is the arsenic exposure pre switching and on the y axis is post switching on the left panel is based on a spectrometric and the right panel is a simulated kit categories once again i've colored them so all the arsenic concentration less than 10 ppb is shown in blue between 10 and 50 is shown in green so these will don't switch right because we are not asking them to switch but for all the wells greater than 50 ppb we ask them to switch and as you can see that they all fall below the one to one line the the black dashed line so showing that the arsenic concentration or arsenic exposure in these people using these wells have decreased dramatically you, you should add a five percent error in instrumental measurement so it's not going to look quite like that mm -hmm. so we that's not sure you can't really see we did that actually it's really yeah, small it's not, 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 there, right? not in this figure but i've done uncertainty analysis it was yeah. really a small but that should be a reference it should be instrumental it should not be the perfect measurement yes yeah. it's just so tiny small the yeah. error bars are eaten by so it. if you look at the kit categories you can clearly see that these green here you know uh, uh these are the wells whose actual concentration was as you can see there are some green dots here or circles here whose actual concentration was more than 50, but they were classified or colored as green because of the uncertainties and kit. And their arsenic didn't change because we thought that they are nice wells, so we didn't ask them to switch. A lot of the wells are red here, where the actual concentration is less than 50 ppp, but they are assigned as red, false positive because of the kit. And what is interesting to see here is that for most of these wells, where we assigned them as red, they're post switching their concentration went down so in essence we are reducing their arsenic concentration but there are some wells here where the arsenic concentration went up because of the error associated with the or the uncertainty associated with the kit uh, kit uh, measurements you said for those all the case where both the drinking water well and the well they switched to were misclassified one being a false positive the other being a false negative In order for that to happen no so this will only be possible if you are if you are actually identified as red and you are switching to a well that was identified as green but it was not actually green right but if you're misidentified as a red and then you go to a well that was misidentified as a green that's the only way that yes that's the only way that will happen and and in the next in the next uh, table that's what i'm going to show well it's a small probability because it's it's basically a multiplication of yeah the false positive yeah. False. yeah so that's exactly the question that charlie brought up what's the probability of switching from a well low in arsenic to a well high in arsenic so the unwanted effect of kit measurements and for the 6000 whatever 600 wells we have only 17 wells uh, the original arsenic exposure was less than 50 ppb and it increased to between 50 and 75 only two wells it increased from less than 50 to between 75 and 100 ppb and for no wells it increased from less than 50 ppb to greater than 100 ppb so the probability of switching from an uncontaminated well to a contaminated well is very low and what i want to show here is that in this previous figure which i didn't discuss is that okay all these wells the arsenic exposure is increasing right so post switching it's higher than pre switching but it's not going from here yeah. Yeah. Yeah to all the way here right it's it's around the mean increase is around 10 ppb 10 microgram per liter so yes it is increasing but not dramatically so that brings me to uh to a big question well we all know spectrometric measurements are much better they are good why don't we use them so why do we use kit measurements so i'm trying to put that point across using an uh, using example. So let's say we have a city like Arai Hazar where 50% of the well have arsenic greater than 50 parts per billion. And uh, let's assume 10% use, uh, uh, use one well. And so in general, there are 60,000 people in that village. Now, kit measurements are around $1 one 
uh, and mass spec measurements are around dollar ten. And if you have a two thousand dollar budget, how many wells can you measure, and how many people can you help? So if we use kit, we will see a reduction on arsenic for five thousand people from greater than fifty parts per billion to less than fifty, and the mean arsenic exposure would reduce to seventy three parts per billion. However, one forty people would be exposed to an increased level of arsenic. You know, with because again, once again, for the uncertainties associated with kit measurements, with mass spec, we will only reduce the arsenic exposure for six hundred people from more than fifty to less than fifty. The mean arsenic exposure of the entire population will still be high. However, on a good side, no person will experience an increase in arsenic exposure. Now there is a moral dilemma here. Now should I use kit because I know I will probably be affecting some people in a bad way. They will. Uh, experience an increase in the arsenic exposure and especially it becomes challenging you know uh, from a policy point of view where uh, you don't know you know what is the right answer and another point that i wanted to highlight is that what if we use these kits in a region where majority of the wells are between 30 and 100 ppb because in arai hazar most of the wells had arsenic greater than 100 ppb so the misclassifications was very low but if in a region all the wells are let's say between 10 and 100 parts per billion there will be much more misclassifications so to conclude i would say that the kit performs very well uh, it, it it compared to uh, to uh, mass spec for a given budget it reduces the arsenic exposure of almost eight times more people than 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 mass specs but there are some caveats as i've discussed that some people would experience an increase in arsenic exposure so the main point uh, i want to drive through this uh, this presentation is that the kits perform exceptionally well in identifying very very contaminated well however their success rate is low for wells between 30 and 75 parts per billion i understand for some people in this room this value might still be very high but i guess from bangladesh perspective it's it can be considered low the mean reduction in arsenic exposure uh, based upon kit measurements and those based upon accurate uh, uh, spectrometric measurements are also comparable and similar and overall if slight increase in arsenic exposure of a small population is acceptable uh, i think uh, kits are the way to go and uh, i think the bangladeshi government is taking the right decision <laughs> to go ahead uh, with using kits to uh, to measure arsenic and kind of reduce the arsenic exposure thank you so much I was the only thing I was thinking is that of course we don't have a risk of lawsuit. I was thinking in the yeah, US yeah. this would not work out because even though this is small for number, then people can go and test with the ICPMS and show that we did something wrong for them. And, uh, so that in in a scenario where lawyers are important. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the U.S., you can get better art. But yeah, that's right. So, Annie. Okay. Yeah, I'll just try to pick right. which okay. one. So, the first couple slides I had here were I hope will be helpful for some people, maybe for the Chile cohort, um, which is how we have this method that Anna has developed previously with um, some collaborators to try and isolate. The part of urinary arsenic that's coming from drinking water um, in populations that have high seafood intake. So, what this graph or this little image here shows you is that water and recent food intake both can contribute inorganic arsenic, which is then methylated to MMA and again to DMA, which make up total urine arsenic. In addition, this re recent seafood intake can contribute these very high levels of arsenal sugars and arsenal lipids and this compound arsenobetaine, which you've heard a lot about. These arsenal sugars and lipids can contribute to the DMA that we're measuring in urine and arsenobetaine can contribute itself to the total urine arsenic. So the challenge is when you have... How much weight goes each way on that? Around half. So half of it goes into the other category. Yeah, this is DMA up here. So and are, and the, and because there is so much of the arsenic in the seafood, yeah. The the DMA is going to be probably eighty percent coming from seafood and then tiny coming from organic. So most if you have seafood intake, most of your DMA is going to be from seafood. With a seafood intake of in organic. Yeah. 
the, the half that gets transformed. No, well, what's the toxic? The toxic is the fat. The yes. Toxic. So the typically. Toxic. So the stuff that gets transformed is it toxic? toxic? MMA is toxic. DMA has the lowest toxicity. DMA is pretty non toxic. So I can't say it's going into DMA. DMA is up here. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. typically, and yeah. we would yeah. sum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So typically, the, we DMA would. DMA is not so toxic as the other stuff. So the transformed isn't so bad for you. Correct, but the okay. challenge is that there's a lot of variability between people in how in your methylation capacity. So typically, we would want to sum these three together to deal with differences in methylation capacity between people. But if these guys, their seafood is contributing to your DMA, that's a that's a problem. So how do you isolate either the inorganic arsenic coming from water or the inorganic arsenic that's coming from both water and food without some, contributions from and seafood and dust? And dust. And dust. Yeah. But I mean, that's usually happening quite a wide organic urine at least. Like in the US population, it's highly It depends on what lab you're using, I think. <laughs> so for the CDC lab, yes. The large majority, 90% plus undetectable, but that's because of the limits of detection. Yeah. For example, in the strong art study, that's not the case. And, 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 and people have a lot of MMA. And that MMA is coming from inorganic arsenic. The fact, the fact that we have the undetectable inorganic is just because the levels of inorganic are always the lowest. Mm -hmm. And if you combine that with very high limit of detection, uh, it's not because people are not exposed to inorganic arsenic. Yeah. So then what we can do, in this case, this example that I'm presenting to you, we wanted to isolate specifically arsenic, inorganic arsenic from drinking water. Mm -hmm. So here we tried to remove the contribution from food and also from seafood to get this drinking water inorganic arsenic biomarker. But you can think that we could modify this for dust, for to keep in food sources, to keep in dust sources, or to remove them, depending on. In the urine, can you, can you tell the two apart? Because of acetobutane. Acetobutane is what tells you, because you see acetobutane is correlated it's down here. With, with the other. Seafood is a common source for acetobutane. Yeah. Okay. So you can tell that apart. Yeah. yeah. The bottom line, but then there's another line that says other metabolites. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but the other metabolites you don't measure them. They are measured in the total arsenic, but they are very really hard to measure by analytically. Yeah. So, so if you naively thought that those were um, inorganic arsenic. You yes. could. Okay. Then, then you are thinking, and it's not toxic at all. So you could right. be making a huge mistake. Okay. Yeah. So what we do analytically to get this recalibrated marker of inorganic arsenic coming from, in this case, just water, is we do this regression model down here where we regress all other potential sources of these arsenicals onto the arsenical of interest. In this case, we would do DMA or total arsenic. And so the residuals from this model down here, which uh, this area down here, uh, which you can't see, are in theory the, the, either the total arsenic or the DMA that's not coming, in this case, from arsenobetaine, rice, <laughs> cereal, juice, etc. whatever you put into your model that you want to remove. If we add those residuals back to the conditional mean of, say, DMA among our non-smokers who didn't eat fish, have no detectable arsenobetaine, and didn't report eating these arsenic-containing foods, that should give us a biomarker of inorganic arsenic coming just from drinking water. So maybe that's helpful. Uh, yeah. There's, there's a kind of interesting conceptual thing with this mass balance model is how is it really different than doing uh, regression? Yeah, I and mean, Brittany will explain that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seems that the regression is an important piece, but then you need to add you are trying to estimate all these unknowns, no? Right, right, but, but how, is, how is that different than estimating those unknowns through a you regression know, model? Yeah, so like that's this? what we do in our daily life. And, and yeah. maybe it's not, it's just yeah. a different way of looking at the same thing. So I'm not, yeah. 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 We can think, I think when we have tried these other databases, mm -hmm. you might be kind of Well, this is yeah. the standard procedure. You, you came up with this idea. It's, it's, so, so it's used in nutrition a bit, it's been used uh -huh. in other settings. Uh -huh. I mean, we didn't invent that from nowhere. Uh -huh. We applied yeah. it from the yeah, nutritional yeah. epidemiology to the environmental. Yeah. The thing that I like about the mass balance is that you're not just like, oh, what would, like, what does this look like? What, you know, 
know, should I pick some arbitrary shape that just kind of looks like, but you're like actually saying like, based on physical reality, this is the shape we would expect the data to take. Now yeah. let's check if the data take that shape. Whereas yeah. I feel like a lot of times, I don't know, sometimes when you're doing stats, it's kind of like, I don't really know what I expect. But it's even the uncertainties about exposure assessment, we think that the measures that we have are going to exceed the physical world might be a big stretch. Mm -hmm. okay. But here's that it's with a with a regression approach, particularly when you use logs, mm -hmm. you know, which change the you can't do a mass balance on logs. Mm -hmm. You could end up with answers that are physically impossible. Yeah. You know, they you, seem to be quite physical actually. And, and oh, okay, but these outliers are the ones who give you results that are not biologically possible. Yeah, but I mean by physically impossible, you yeah. I think you could end up with answers that you know imply that say that more arsenic is coming out of the body than ever went in. Uh -huh. It's mathematically possible. That's what the mass balance equations yeah. statistics no, prevent. Yeah. yeah, you have one less degree of freedom there. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't have that. Uh, yeah. Do you want to see this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's be on that. It looks great. It looks great. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It's, a, it's an art. Perfect. So the last thing I want to mention really quickly, which we found yesterday was actually hopefully quite useful to the New Mexico group. So I want to let everyone else know about it too, especially if you're working in the U.S. So our group's been cleaning the EPA's six-year review contaminant occurrence data for arsenic. So this is data that community water, all public water systems, including community water systems, um, are monitoring for arsenic in their systems. Um, typically on a yearly basis or every three years, and sending that data into EPA, which EPA then collects and cleans and publishes online. So what we were able to do for the New Mexico group yesterday was pool all of the public water arsenic um, data, which we've cleaned into three-year averages uh, based on the standard monitoring um, requirements under the Safe Drinking Water Act for arsenic. So we think that the three-year averages are the most reasonable giving the, the sampling requirements uh, and, and give those values to them. So hopefully that, and you saw some improvement in your correlation between your urinary arsenic values and your water estimates using that EPA data yesterday, I believe. Yeah, which is great. This is one of the, one of the problems with the consumer confidence reports in your public water systems is if you don't exceed the MCL, you're not required to report what the level is. You're also not required to test what the problem is. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. fundamental built-in data gaps in this mm -hmm. report. So picking the average really kind of helps alleviate that problem. Right. Because this database includes detected values that are below the maximum contaminant level. Mm -hmm. So we also aggregated this up to the county level, um, considering all the community water systems they're reporting for a given county, weighing that by the population served by each of those community water systems. So if Someone out there is looking for public water arsenic data across the U.S. from between 2006 and 2011. We have some clean data that <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're hoping to get out soon. We, yeah, the goal is once the paper is published that we put it in the database, in the website, and to hopefully advertise as much as we can. And uh, Andres gave us the good idea yesterday to, that you can click in whatever county and then you can know your level. Mm -hmm. And that would be the social media. If you drink from a public water supply. So yes. If you drink from a public water supply, which is 78% of the population right. in the US, so that's yeah. going to be very useful. But I have a question that that'll probably go on forever. But why, is, <laughs> why is the Southwest different? Is the Rocky Mountains, no? <laughs> well, certainly there's <laughs> probably more than one reason. I mean, if you talk to <laughs> The USGS, they would link it mostly to hydrothermal operation. Yeah. Yeah. It's also a lot bigger counties. So that you're getting a yeah. modifiable rate fairly good problem. But even if the size of the county I don't think that matters in the fact that there is also in the sodium rock scale. Yeah. And, and these are oxy water scales, right? So it has nothing to do with the uh, reduction of RNA. Yeah. Yeah. It's also the redneck. I mean, I hate coming from my field, I feel less compelled not to say this. But <laughs> It's also the the live free sort of Western spirit of doing your own thing. But, but these are, these are <laughs> public water. They, you don't have to fix it. I mean, you can see the political boundaries, like for example, between New Mexico and Texas, uh, and things like that. You, you see political boundaries which don't exist. Yeah. Right? Well, we've got our New England. In Maine, we've got the 
redneck called drinking a well water, <laughs> and that would push it way up. <laughs> but you, you think it's just more uh, sulf sulfide minerals? Well, I think it's more mineralization historically, whether it's sulfide mineral related or secondary. I'll stay out of that argument. But, but it's not more groundwater. I mean, it's more groundwater, most of that is groundwater. There are some systems that yeah. we talked about yesterday. There are surface water systems that are yes. high. Zoltan yeah. is pointing out that it's also evapotranspirative yeah. concentrations yeah. in the high pH. Okay, because another explanation would just be that they, they drink more groundwater. I should know the answer to that. I don't really know what the groundwater is. I think it's more in, in, the, in the west of the country, there's more groundwater than in the east. Yeah. And, I mean, the east is for surface water. You can't have a train and do yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, so that might account for it. And in the Pacific Northwest, of course, some mm -hmm. lots of Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the proportion of groundwater fed into the municipal device. Yeah. 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 Question for Andy, how far back in time can you go to do records? So the so there's this is the third six year review of data. EPA also has a, a first year review of this data, which doesn't have arsenic. The second six year review data happened during a time when the MCL was still at 50 micrograms per liter. So the reporting limit during that time period is too high to be useful for this purpose in the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is kind of the goal is that this the exposure of water and social data can be linked with that human health. Yeah, because we have at the community water system level and also at the county level, but you can imagine there are other geographic units between that that might be useful. And the goal is actually also to integrate it with the groundwater and private one data using the USGS data, and that's what Maya is working on. And it's super interesting because then for each county, we'll be able to better integrate and reflect what people are actually drinking, combining both the community water system and the private one. Yeah. Oh, so that's we are tracking. And, you, and you know how people. much water is coming from yes. private wells, so yes. you can make a. Yeah. 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 So that and we're what Maya will hopefully be working on maybe this summer is linking this with NHANES data. So the urine arsenic data in NHANES, which we've talked a lot about, um, getting the geographic information at the restricted data center. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> additional difference between the west and the east is our water system design and how many municipal wells are in a unit that has water system. Yeah. 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 Having much more dependence on a smaller set of wells. When you have a municipal system that's high, it tends to be very high, as opposed to a blended source that happens when you have resilience of water. So well, is that different than just saying they drink more groundwater? But it's not how it's not how much, it's it how many wells it comes out of. So that when you have a high well, it represents more of the whole water supply, and then that whole water supply is high. And then there are fewer water supplies in the district, so that they come out. You know, you're asking about the difference between colors. That's another factor that probably plays a role. So one county in the West might be three, three wells as opposed to 50. Okay. So yeah. why don't we continue this conversation with lunch? And uh, we take a little break, we relax a little bit, and then in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, we start the end. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you so much, yeah, everyone well, online. Well, it was well, summer. Well, <laughs> The New Mexico border with Texas does stick out.